Hello everyone, I'm Grandmaster Alejandro Ramirez here to bring you Game 3 of the World Championship match between Magnus Carlsen and Jan Nepomniachtchi. After two very exciting games that saw many material imbalances, the players didn't bring the action today and we did see a little bit of a tepid affair, but with plenty of subtleties. Let's jump in the action. The challenger remained faithful to his e4 and of course Magnus didn't deviate either. We saw a Spanish opening yet again on game 3. After e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, bishop d5, a6, bishop a4, knight f6, castles, bishop e7, rook e1, b5, bishop b3, and castles, we reached the same position that we had on game 1 between these two players. And of course, the question would be, what would be Jan's reply? Would his team try to find a hole in the variation after h3, knight a5, which was essayed the last time between these two players, or would they come up with something new? And the answer, back to the main lines. a4, which is currently the main line of this position. Certainly something that Magnus Carlsen had considered, and he quickly replied with the most popular move nowadays, bishop b7. d3 was played, d6, knight bd2, and we reach one of the tabias of modern chess, a well-known Spanish position that is considered to be a little bit on the slow side, but full of interesting strategical concepts and plenty of maneuvering. In this position, black has tried pretty much any move. Queen d7 has been tried, we've seen knight d7 as well, but the main line certainly still remains knight a5. Knight a5 is a favorite of Russian Grandmaster Evgeny Tomashevsky, and it is the most solid variation as far as I am concerned. However, Magnus yet again finds a line that is not the most topical, it's not the number one recommendation of the engine, but it still gives a little bit of an interesting idea or a little bit of a new concept to the entire position. And here he actually takes the time to play the move Rook E8. If you go down on your database, this is not even the top five most popular moves in the position, and yet Magnus believes in the solidity of his position and of this move. After Rook E8, Jan decided to continue maneuvering his pieces and in traditional Spanish fashion. The knight goes back to f1, where it can reach e3, and then hop over to d5 or f5. Notice that in this kind of positions, the, the squares in the center that are light colored are of particular importance. White tends to dominate these positions, and if black is ever able to break through with the move d5, then usually they tend to achieve full equality. The question is, who is gonna win that strategical battle? And off they go, because they need to immediately control the center. Knight f1 was played, followed by h6, which is a very logical move considering what I have just said. The light squares are of extreme importance, especially in the center, and the move h6 simply prevents this bishop on c1 from coming to g5, trading itself for the knight on f6, and therefore weakening the control that black could potentially have on this diagonal, as d5 would be severely weakened. Also, in many positions, it prevents the knight from coming to g5, and attacking the pawn on f7, a multi-purpose move. Bishop d2 was played, and at this point Jan has many, many options. He could have played for knight g3, he could go extremely aggressive with something like h3 and g4, taking advantage of the fact that there's a close center, or even doing it in a crazier way with knight e3 and g4, trying to break open with g5, or a more solid and, let's see, much better approach which is to play on the queen side. He plays with the move bishop d2, eyeing this diagonal and preparing a potential break, and we'll see what he settles on in a couple of moves. Bishop f8 was played. Again, a slow maneuvering game. Here, Carlsen hides the bishop on f8, allowing this rook to defend the pawn on e5, which eventually will allow him to finally make the break that he so badly wants. This one with the move d5. Knight e3 was played. The move 97 was played in response. Again, the strategy revolving around the square that I've mentioned, and the knight is multi-purpose in this position. Not only does it allow you to hit the center with d5 in a later date, but it also defends f5, and in many cases, well, not in this game, you see the knight maneuver itself to g6 and go back to f4. In many kinds of Spanish, for example, the Briar or the Chigorin, it's clear that the knight on c6 has to move away from that square relatively early because it is one of black's worst pieces. You don't really want to stick it on d4 because after these exchanges, the pawn on d4 tends to be vulnerable 
And this knight on f5 is just a dominant piece, especially with the bishop now hiding on b7 instead of its usual diagonal down on c8 and h3. Therefore, the knight does maneuver itself to e7. It can't go to a5, of course, because of white's uh, preventing that position. And Nepo clearly states his intentions. The move c4 is the kind of move that really reveals the strategy behind white's last moves. It is possible, again, to play relatively slowly. We've seen ideas of breaking on the king side with pawn pushes, although they don't belong as well with the move bishop d2. And you could also consider maneuvering very slowly with something like c3, bishop c2, defend this pawn somehow on e4, and then continue with the move d4, taking control over the center. But that might prove to be a little bit too slow, as you can see that black is gearing up for the move d5, and in essence, he's only a couple of moves away from achieving it. It's true that the pawn on e5 is currently hanging, but you can imagine that the move knight g6, followed by d5, will simply give Carlsen full equality. Therefore, c4 changes the character of the position. It's a pawn break that forces a reaction from the black side. You definitely don't want to take on a4 and open up this file. It, black is being threatened on b5 to capture twice in that position. So you have to figure out how to defend the pawn. You could defend it with a move like queen d7 or c6, but they can become quite unnatural. And instead, Carlsen goes for the most logical approach. Trade a side pawn, a flank pawn, for a semi-central pawn like it is on c4. B takes c4, and of course here, white takes with the knight. Why does he take with the knight? Because he's eyeing this square on a5, because he is eyeing this square on e5, and because the knight is just really, really well placed. Uh, this also, again, this allows the possibility for black to play the move d5. And actually, this had all been played before. I don't think the, the players were familiar with the game that I'm about to mention, simply because it isn't one of the top games in the world, and because they were taking a lot of time reaching this position. But there was a game between Grandmaster Arahamia Grand and uh, Women International Master Yildiz that reached this position specifically. And there is a slight trick in this position that Black in that game was unable to see. She played the move Rook B8 and was heavily punished by Knight takes E5, Pawn takes E5, Knight takes E5, and the action of this bishop and this knight on F7 proved to be too dangerous. There is no good way of defending the F7 square, and on a good day, black ends up only down a pawn. Actually, black collapsed in that game very quickly. Instead of that, of course, Magnus was well aware of the danger of knight takes e5, and plays what would be a paradoxical move, but the more you analyze it, the more sense it makes. The move knight c6, the knight returns to c6, having left that square only a couple of moves ago, but now it makes are plenty of sense with the remaining moves that Black wants to play. He wants to play the move to rook b8, start targeting things down on the b file, including, of course, the b4 square. And in many other occasions, Black is willing to play the move a5, certainly a weakening of his pawn, but on the other hand, he gains space on the queen side and makes this b pawn a backward pawn for the rest of the game. So, strategical give and take. Rook c1 and a great decision, and I think this is a very hard decision to make over the board, especially because it doesn't seem like you absolutely need to play this move right away, but the more you delve into the situation, you realize that against any move, and I'm gonna make just a random move to make a point, king h8, knight a5, black's position might become a little bit unpleasant. Knight takes a5, bishop takes a5, you start targeting a slightly backwards and weakened pawn on c7, you take advantage of this spin, and things just don't go so well for black. So what Magnus does is that he actually puts his pawn on a weekend square on a5 that's already being targeted twice by the knight on c4 and by the bishop on d2. Again, counterintuitive, but an excellent positional understanding. The pawn on a5 is doing a great job here of preventing, first of all, this knight from coming to a5 itself, and also guaranteeing the fact that white is not going to have access to the b4 square, and it's actually black that would love to install a knight there on a later date. Bishop d3 is a great move. It allows uh, two things. First of all, the move queen d2 might come down on the board, and again, it will be a triple threat on the a5 pawn. That pawn is very close to falling, so black needs to do something quickly. And on the other hand, it also prevents, sorry, it also allows 
the move d4 to be played with extra pressure on the king side, of course, allowing this bishop access to the a1, h8 diagonal. Another lovely move here by Magnus Carlsen, the move bishop c8, a retreating move that improves this bishop. It's not doing very much on this diagonal because the knight on c6 is already on a good square. The knight doesn't want to invade on b4 anytime soon. So the bishop needs to be improved, and here it has two ideas. Of course, it can go to g4 and make the move d4 a lot harder, but more likely is the idea bishop e6, making sure that black keeps pressure on this diagonal on e6 to b3, not allowing this bishop to control this one freely. So for example, a move like queen d2, which triple threats the pawn on a5, can be met with the move bishop e6, and this construction on the diagonal is actually relatively awkward for the white side. Black's moves start to flow in this position. You can imagine the move queen b8, or even queen d7, with the idea of installing this rook on b8, and black's pieces just sort of flow on their own. Therefore, Nepomniachti does not give him any time to do that. He plays the move d4, immediately breaking open the center. There's really no choice by Carlsen. You cannot allow this move d5 to come on the board. Also, d takes e5 is a threat. This pawn must be eliminated. Pawn takes d4, knight takes d4. Again, there is a threat on c6. No choice, really. Knight takes d4, queen takes d4, and bishop e6. And I think this is a critical point in this position, and Nepomniachtchi must have thought exactly the same thing because he took a huge 30-minute think exactly here, trying to figure out the most accurate way of continuing. After analyzing it plentifully with powerful engines, it seemed to be a consensus that the move queen d3 was the only way to keep a real edge on the position. Even that, it's not so clear how big of an advantage it is. The more the engines analyzed it, the more it thought that black was just fine and it was close to equality. Nepo did not find the move queen d3, and to be quite honest with you, it's a very subtle move that I don't quite understand. Instead, he made a more human decision, h3, but I think this more or less is an admittance that white cannot be better. The move simply prevents moves to g4, but black wasn't really threatening this. It does give a loft, but that is, well, <laughs> far away from now at the moment. So it gives black the option of equalizing in one of two ways. There is a direct move, d5, or what I consider to be a practically better decision, what Carlson did, play the move c6, defend this pawn with the queen, and prepare the move d5. You never know when taking with the pawn on d5 will be superior than taking with the piece, and it just solidifies the structure uh, for the time being, challenging white to really find the move in this position. And it's really not so easy to do so. This rook is already placed well on the c file. You don't want to move it out of that situation. You don't want to move this rook to d1 either because there are going to be problems with the e4 pawn being undefended. So for this and many other reasons, Nepo decides to put the bishop on c2. Finally, actually threatening something. If this rook comes to d1 with one more move, you will be able to attack the pawn on d6. And black would be in a little bit of trouble. You have a couple of weaknesses on a5 and on d6, so this is the time to strike. This is the time where Carlsen really needs to finally break open the center, the move that we've been talking about since the beginning of this video, the move d5. That if this is achieved in a tactical, satisfactory way, then black should be okay. And in this case, it works perfectly. If you take with the pawn, there are many ways to take, but I think queen takes d5, trying to get some pieces off the board, is by far the most accurate. It starts exchanging all of these pieces, and I believe that black has absolutely no problems. The challenger instead decided to play the move e5, but it leads to mass simplifications, and Carlsen, of course, took them right away. Pawn takes e4, queen takes d8, rook takes d8, pawn takes f6, bishop b4, an excellent move. There probably were other ways of equalizing the position, but this one is very, very clean. You cannot take on b4 and give black so many pawns on the queen side. This might become very dangerous at some point. The pawn on a4 is very loose. And this pawn is currently hanging, so you have to take on g7. The uh, sequence that follows is also kind of forced. You want to take on c3, take on c3, take on g7. And in a couple of moves, it's basically vacuumed the entire board. And the players do not stop. King f1, rook b8, rook b1, king f6, takes, takes, rook b1, takes, takes. And we reach a bishop endgame in which, yes, the pawns here are not ideal, but on the other hand, 
with this powerful king coming to e5, there's really no way for white to make progress. As we'll see, this is more or less a trivial draw, and the players decided to get to it very, very quickly. They didn't waste any time in playing the moves king e5, king e2, f5, bishop c2, f4. This cements black's control over the dark squares. There's really no way to push the white pawns on the king side, and a draw becomes more or less inevitable. Here you can see that Nepo has no particular plan, just moves the bishop back and forth. And it's possible that Magnus could have moved the bishop back and forth as well and made a draw, but he can really do whatever he wants at this point. c5, bishop c2, bishop d7, eyeing the a4 pawn just in case he pre-moves the move bishop b1. Of course, that was not going to happen. f3 and king f6. This king has no way into the center anymore because this pawn on f4 is cutting, is cutting it completely, so there is just absolutely no danger for either player and after h4 they found the repetition with king e5 king f2 king f6 king e2 king e5 and king f2 certainly not the action-packed game that we had in games one and two but it was an interesting approach you can see that carlson keeps relying on sidelines that are interesting and not the top engine approved moves to find good positions. Even with deep analysis, it was very difficult to find any real chance, chances for Nepo. It felt like Carlsen had a full understanding of the position, that despite the slightly passive position of most of his pieces, the eventual strategy to prepare and execute the move d5 to give them life seemed inevitable. And this excellent understanding, perhaps even beyond what an engine will show you, doesn't matter how strong that engine is, is what is making him the world champion. And he is, must be happy that with the black pieces, he was presented with no real problems. L tomorrow is a rest day. Let's see what Carlson brings with the white pieces on game four in a couple of days. Today, more than ever, when the world comes together to create a better tomorrow. It's going to be magic. Oh. Magic. Magic with music. With architecture. With colors. Magic with celebration. With your safety. From here. There. And everywhere. For six whole months, day and night. Join the making of a new world, starting October 1st. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show. It's live coverage from Dubai Exhibition Center. Grandmaster Anna Muzichuk is here with you together with five-time world champion Vishwanathan Anand. After yesterday's rest day, today we are looking forward to watch game four of world championship match between the world champion Magnus Carlsen from Norway and the challenger Jan Nepomnyshi from Russia. Uh, Vishy, before I ask you about your expectations for this game, let me congratulate you and Indian team on winning the World School competition. The tournament finished yesterday and the final stage of it was also played here in Dubai and it was the part of World Expo. Congrats once again. Yes, thanks a lot. It was very nice uh, to be there. I went and made the opening move for Gukesh and um, it was a very narrow victory, so full credit to uh, Saco Oliveras from Peru, but Velamal is the 
school's champion and uh, that's wonderful. They are a great school. They do a lot for chess in India. And, uh, well, they're all very close friends as well. <laughs> so, uh, rooting for the home team. Yeah, it was quite convincing victory. Did you follow uh, like the whole tournament and maybe some of the games? Or yes. just yesterday? Uh, no, I, the tournament was convincing enough. But yesterday was scary. Because um, it's only because Pragnananda won the fifth game, which was really drawn, that uh, they won. Otherwise, it would have gone to a tie break or something. So they they scored 2-2 two -two and he won the decisive game. So it was very narrow. I, to be honest, I think they uh, we blundered at least one game. But still, it was a very close match. Yes, so. and I also heard that earlier there was quite a tough match against Mongolian team who finished third in the end. Uh, did you also see that one? A bit. Uh, I mean, uh, in general, there are too many games to follow. But uh, yeah, <laughs> I, saw, I saw the highlights, let's say. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, Vichy, it was a rest day yesterday, but I know it was not a completely uh, an entire rest day for you. You gave a lecture to the young generation and I was there. I actually really enjoyed it. So thanks for doing that. Uh, how was it for you? It was nice. Um, luckily, I got to show some games from the match and uh, I tried to because I assumed they would be curious what's going on. And then I showed a little bit of um, the game that Magnus and Jan almost ended up in, which was Gelf and uh, Shiro from long back. Which we mentioned though, that stream. A yes, little. yes, exactly. <laughs> and um, yeah, I think I think they had fun. It was uh, a nice gr uh, group of kids, and it's always nice. Must be exciting for them to be here and to watch the World Championship live. Must be a great experience for them. Yeah, of course, I think it was a really nice lecture and uh, moreover, I think it was wonderful that you were present there and that uh, kids could see you because you are the mentor for Indian chess players and I believe for also many other young kids all over the world. Uh, so maybe you can tell a few, uh, tell us a few words about uh, Indians uh, and about the young generation. They are actually making a huge progress and there are many... Uh, uh, talents and uh, rising stars. Yes, very much. We obviously have a very talented uh, group. I would say it's <coughs> maybe a bit early, but uh, you can see that they could very well turn out to be a golden generation. Uh, Nihal, Prag, Gukesh, Gukesh Mendonca, uh, Mendonca and, and also girls, Divya. Yes, Divya, uh, Raunak. So. Uh, did I, which one? I always leave out one. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, Arjun Erika, I see. And um, so all of them um, are doing incredibly well. And um, last year, I started uh, the, the West Prajan and the Academy to try and work with uh, some of our youngsters because while a lot of them are very, very strong, uh, I want to help them, help motivate them and push them a little bit to get to 2700 and hopefully one day find themselves here. So that will be very nice. Uh, Visha, that's really kind of you and that's a great project. So the Academy is named after your name. Yes, uh, it, the sponsor is Westbridge Capital and uh, Anand, so Westbridge Anand uh, Chess Academy. And how often do you give trainings there? We have a regular schedule every month. Uh, we have some coaches and so on. and. Uh, in fact, the opposite is the problem, that when they start going to play, then we can't chase them with more <laughs> classes. We have to let them play some tournaments. Uh, but they did very well this year, and I'm very happy. No, really, I see that India is is doing really a lot, and uh, Sagar Shah uh, producing a lot of chess-based videos. He's very active uh, in that direction. So I am really amazed uh, what you are doing, and I really appreciate it, because, uh, because it's, uh, it's making our game more popular and uh, more fascinating. Uh, we are uh, waiting for the game to start. The game is, uh, to s is about to start in uh, six minutes, but soon we'll have the presentation of the players. And uh, yeah, what are your expectations for today's game? Well, it's nice. After a rest day, um, Magnus gets to play, start with white this time, after a rest day. So, uh, and this is always uh, the point of maximum uh, effort because you have spent the whole day preparing for today, I think Magnus will have focused on white and Jan will have focused on black. It's difficult to prepare for games in the future because you don't know what will happen in the games that come first. 
So imagine that they had also prepared for the fifth game, but today something goes wrong. Anyway, they will not use it. So it was very important to focus on today. I hope, um, or I'm guessing, he will check the Catalan again. But you know, so far, Magnus is trying to be unpredictable, so maybe he'll do something completely different. Yeah, that's completely possible. I, even if he see E4, it won't be a big surprise, I think. Yes. Uh, and you know, I saw some photos, and actually Magnus played some uh, football games, and today it's his start first birthday, so let's congratulate uh, Magnus Carlsen on, on his birthday. <laughs> Uh, by the way, he's actually quite used to play World Championship matches on his birthday. I think he did all the last ones and he, where he played the game on his birthday. Yes, I remember the one with Karyakin, uh, the queen at six in the tiebreak. That was on his birthday. And uh, Actually, he got a title because yes. it was tiebreak and the yeah, queen right, at six so was the last move. Really beautiful combination, I believe. Those of you who watch uh, the World Championship matches, uh, actually, you know which game uh, we are talking about. And uh, uh, and so, yeah, queen at six was a really nice combination. But also the previous ones, uh, I think uh, uh, it was more than once that he played a World Championship match game uh, on his birthday. Not against me, and I don't know against Fabiano. With you, uh, it was in... It finished, in uh, it finish, finished earlier. So summer, we yeah. And or early. No, no, it was November, but he was we finished on the 23rd or 25th, something like that. Oh, before. So we didn't get to the 30th. Um, and I don't uh, know what else he has done on... Uh, what are the games he has played on his birthday. I don't think against Fabi also it happened on his birthday. But I could be wrong. Yeah, okay, maybe I'll also confused a little yeah. bit, but uh, yeah. Uh, did you play some game on your birthday? I'm sure you did, but maybe not that often. Yes, I have played, but uh, Both players, typically in of London. Of course, fantastically uh, prepared, okay, great fighters. To Morris. Three draws, with match now tied at one and a half points each. We expect fighting chess today, and as usual, we are here welcoming you from... Expo Dubai. We are at the Dubai Exhibition Center, a fantastic venue and a great place for chess as we take part of this historic event, the first of its kind in the Middle East. Well, now let's get to the players themselves. With the white pieces today, first up, from Norway, the world champion Magnus Carlsen. And playing with the black pieces, from Russia, the challenger, Jan Nepomnesci. Overseeing the first move of the event, the president of FIDE, Arkady Dvorkovich. and a special guest making the first move, His Excellency, the General Secretary of the Dubai Sports Council, once again, His Excellency, Saeed Harev. His Excellency will make the first move for Magnus Carlsen.
I'll be back. I'll be back. And with that, let the game begin. The game has started with first move e4 where Jan played e5, so now the player they switched, yeah? <laughs> yes, exactly, but maybe Jan will play uh, Petrov, yes, Russian defense. I was actually, before the match, I was actually very curious if you would see a Russian, uh, or Petrov as it's called. Uh, Jan doesn't play it so often, but it's a very solid opening and I think quite a reasonable choice for a world championship match. Uh, Fabiana Caruana tried to, to play Petrov in uh, the previous match against Magnus Carlsen and uh, it was quite successful for him, so now let's see how it will work out for Jan Nepomeshi. It's a surprise for me, but uh, on the other hand, for this match, it is almost an obvious choice that uh, Jan would uh, include the Petrov because its theoretical status is quite good right now. And uh, the only thing is Jan ha hasn't played it very often. He plays it more often with, uh, he faces it, of course, more often with white rather than black. Uh -huh. But uh, Magnus was, may not be happy with this. On the other hand, he asked for it in a way. He chose the... Opening, I don't, I don't, uh, he didn't seem very happy against Fabiano, S and uh, I'm curious how it'll go today. Uh, against Fabiano, he tried fifth small knight, it knight c3 instead of d4 in two games. So, and here he opted for uh, for fifth small d4. That's right. So, this is the main variation. It's interesting whether Jan will go bishop d6 or whether he will stick to bishop e7. Both are okay, bishop d6 still quite a main line so castle yeah I thought Jan might play uh, uh, no it's not King of Eight, it, it was King of Eight. he's gone his castle his castle uh, so I, I thought about uh, Petrov I also thought that uh, we might see a Berlin also a very solid opening uh, but well then uh, besides Roy Lopez he had to prepare Italian and also other lines in that case Yes, once very long back when the Berlin was uh, just starting out, uh, Kramnik told me Berlin is just the Petrov without any theory. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I think now it's the opposite because the Berlin was played so heavily that uh, the Petrov is probably the Berlin without the theory. So, so what are the main lines here? These days, uh, white plays c4, c6. I think queen c2 is not that popular these days. Uh, rookie one or knight c3 is common but most of the interesting games in this line from white's perspective are Jan's games so it's <laughs> <laughs> uh, interesting to see how where Magnus thinks he can catch him yes m Jan himself he tried many lines against Petrov including fifth uh, move d4 direction and uh, we have a c4 on the board so uh, now we are expecting c6. I don't think there are other um, reasonable options here. c6 is by far the most uh, critical yeah. here and uh, the main move. And after c6, white has a lot of options. Like c takes d5, knight c3, queen c2. Uh, these are the moves that I tried myself. <laughs> yes. It's a tough, uh, it's a tough line. Um, 30 years back, it was uh, very hard to find uh, an edge with white, and it's still the same. The main point is because uh, of the symmetry of the position. Except for black's knight, the position is identical. The only thing is the black knight, instead of being on this square, is on this square. And so that gives uh, limited uh, strategic options. But uh, with computers, you can obviously go very, very deep, and uh, that's what they've probably done. Well, after uh, c6, uh, I'm a bit surprised that Jan is taking some time here. I agree. I, c6 is such an obvious move that uh, there is no need to think about it. 
unless he's going to do something really strange. But he's, there's never, there hasn't been a serious alternative to C6 that I've seen ever. Oh, okay, Jan, uh, Jan is away from the board. That makes sense. Ah, okay. <laughs> Uh, that uh, he hasn't played C6 yet, but uh, but he will do it when he is back. So many games after C6 have been played in this position, and uh, maybe we can so show some of the lines, mm -hmm. in, in, like in which direction the game can continue. So it used to be that this was, at least my understanding, that it was considered the main line. But then a very surprising move started to be played uh, about six, a year I back. I think uh, Aronian implied Aronian. it. <laughs> and, uh, but I heard about it even before, so it, maybe it was already being played in computer games and so on. Yeah, sure, but like the first top player who did it in, ah. a, like in an actual game was Aronian, and he played it 8-6. Maybe even in some online game, so he was not afraid to show some of the yeah. novelties. Sure. <laughs> of the, uh, uh, like uh, while playing the uh, less important game. What is... Uh, can we refresh? No, they have not yet. So we're waiting for Magnus's move, right? The other idea is rookie one. Rookie eight is less popular than uh, bishop f5. And after bishop f5, queen b3, they play queen d7. Now the position is getting incredibly sharp. So you have... Uh, I remember your games here. <laughs> yes. You cannot capture on d5 because of bishop h2 check and then you lose the queen so what white does is something like um, c takes d5 c takes d5 or another topical line is this one knight c3 a very sharp line i would say where uh so black now captures here uh, white captures here, black captures here, and if white plays this, this is an incredibly sharp and complex line. Uh, it leads to a kind of uh, end game. Queen d7. Queen d7. You capture here. Uh, no, sorry, you, you take here because capturing does not work out, the queen gets trapped. But you play queen d7, knight d7. And here's the interesting moment, which unbalances a lot. If you capture the knight, black simply takes the pawn. And it's considered to be okay for black. Yes, because the black knight can come and defend the pawn like that. Or maybe and even, even come yeah. to this nice square. So white now plays again intermezzo, an in-between move. You play this with Karana, right? I played this with uh, Fedosev. Caruana, maybe. Fedosia for sure. Uh, okay, I remember many uh, Caruana's yes, games. Yes, but there are lots of games, yeah. Caruana has also played this quite often. Okay. And uh, black surprisingly takes this pawn. You take this, then you go back. And then white goes here. And this is a f crucial part of white's plan, which is white is taking away that square from the rook. Um... <coughs> and then white strategy is to push white before. strategy before or to bring the rook up like this and enter here because the, all the while the square is covered. But black will simply uh, simply harass the knight with his kingside pawns, uh, bring these pawns and try to shut that diagonal. So anyway, very uh, complex position. Both of them must have studied it in great depth if they are entering here. And uh, what has Magnus played? Yeah, let's check because it's an important moment which direction Magnus chose after C6. So we can see C4, C6. And then we need an update. Okay. 
Another major line here is Cita XD5, Cita XD5 and Knight C3. Yes. But I suspect that that is a line which is easy to neutralize. Or maybe easy is the wrong word, but with good computer preparation, you can clean, clean every last detail. But it is uh, an interesting line. Despite the symmetry has been broken, <coughs> but um, yeah, let's no. see if we can see what are the interesting games here. Bishop d4 here. But I remember many of exciting games by Jan after uh, knight c3 without taking on d5. Yes, that is. Uh, this is also very interesting. Another line which they have tried a lot. So after c6, knight c3, knight c3, knight c3 b takes c3, d, d takes c4, uh, bishop c4, and now there is bishop f5 or bishop g4. So the old move used to be this, but then I think white started to play. So what white has done is to break the pin and then just go with knight e5. Uh, in fact, Jan won a nice game here. Uh, against Fabiano, maybe, yes, but uh, but also this he is won the other a line. very great game. Yeah, after yes. Bishop f5, then Rook e1, Knight d7, Bishop g5, and this is also there's a lot of theory here. So, but this is the line where he made actually all these sacrifices. Sack. Yeah, on, on h6. He actually did it twice uh, in a very similar positions. <laughs> yes, but again, for a match, this must all been be quite well known. So let's see, let's see what they do. I see the queen on b3, but I don't know so maybe it's rookie at one which point it was played. It probably is rookie one bishop f5 then. Yeah. It seems like the rook is on e1. So maybe, yeah, we are going for this line, uh, rook e1, bishop f5, queen b3. I see a, a close view of uh, Magnus and his face. Yeah. Sorry, you're having some minor issues, but... <laughs> We figure out what they have played. Yeah, because right at the moment we just see that it's Magnus to move, but we don't see uh, we don't see the the position. Ah, okay. Here we can figure out. So rook e1, bishop f5, queen b3, queen d7 was played, and the last move is knight c3. Okay, so this is the line we mentioned earlier. This is on the board, and knight c3 is on the board. So let's see if he captures on c3. Or he takes on c4. Both are playable. Okay, he's taken he's on c3. He's taken on c3. By the way, there's a... Bishop f5 played, queen f5. Okay, so all the way here. Is he going to take on b7? In uh, a sense, he has to, because a bc3, b6, I don't think is very dangerous. But it was also played, and I think uh, some of the ideas were fine there, but it was considered nope. that... Actually, actually, that's exactly play, what yeah. he's done. He's gone bc3. Okay, so this, this is interesting. Uh, it's a line which I didn't <laughs> think was critical, but if Magnus is playing it, it must, be, must have somewhere in a minute. So let's have a look. bc3. I guess it's going to be b6. And then I think there were some games with uh, c takes d5 and uh, then uh, oh, sorry. black is uh, chosen between queen takes d5 and c takes d5, but c takes mm -hmm. d5, c takes d5. I, yeah, it seems that this move is unlikely because white will play c4. Yeah. Uh, but you would expect c takes d5 to happen. So b6, but Jan is thinking still about b6. It could be he's not thinking about b6, but he's thinking, why is Mag what is Magnus hoping for? What is he trying to get here? Uh, one little line I remember is that if you play knight e5, then the 
you can't capture with the bishop because you capture with the rook and then this pawn drops off. Actually, it's one of the ideas yeah. to play on this uh, d5 right. kind of weakness. But it's then what black does is knight d7. Knight seven, seven, yeah, indeed. And if you take, then he captures here. You have to capture with the pawn and then knight c5. And then black has great compensation. His knight, his rooks are all able to take advantage of these squares. Okay, so bc3 has happened. And uh, Jan is thinking about b6 or more likely he's thinking, what is Magnus waiting for? What is, uh, because Magnus didn't take very long over b takes c3, and he has come to ready to play the Petrov, so he must have something, some small idea at least. Yeah, we are actually surprised by every Magnus game, and every time uh, the opening choice and the line choice he's choosing. Yes. So he's always the first one to try some unusual idea, or, or some, let's say, rare idea. Yes, okay, so B6 he has got b6. I think it's clear that Jan is not going to play the knight off in this match. <laughs> but uh, Yes, because to prepare a knight off and so to remember, to memorize so many lines there and also to prepare a Petrov. I think it's probably easier on demand to play the Petrov. That is one of the examples of circular reasoning before the match. You think, should I uh, invest the time to make the knight off playable, but then what what will I do with that if my opponent doesn't play <laughs> e4? So let me find something smaller and simpler. And then with the white pieces, he asks the same question. Should I spend all the time refuting his knight off, or shall I skip it as well? And so it, uh, this kind of reasoning starts to take over. Okay, cd5, cd5. Now it's very important to see what move he makes. Is he going to play? Okay, queen b5, queen b5. I think, yeah. yeah. The main move in that position, uh, stopping Black's development because uh, there is also the pin. Queen d7. So this has happened on the board, and this is the current position. Yeah, if knight d7, uh, then I guess uh, c4 was coming. c4, not knight f6. Isn't there something stronger here? Knight h4, bishop g. Uh, Queen C6, Queen C6, yeah, actually, uh, there are just no squares for the bishop, right? It's lost. And this is an unpleasant thing to find out. There is just... Um, in an open board, just absolutely open board, the bishop doesn't have a single square to go to. It can go to B8, because I cannot take this as long as you have a discovered check. But already after bishop B8, I think a move like King H1... Stepping out of the check. Also, Bishop A3 deserves attention. I think more than attention. <laughs> but uh, nonetheless, th okay, this is not going to happen. In fact, Jan played Queen D7 just. And that is the main move. There's nothing to really think about. And, uh, and A4, A4 has happened. So Magnus's logic is that if you take here, he has improved this pawn. And it's now putting pressure on that one. And that maybe he can do something with this. We're talking of microscopic advantages, but uh, there's no one better in the world to take advantage of microscopic advantages than Magnus Carlsen. So, in indeed, Still queen takes b5, a b5. One method for black is to get it over with and play a5. Say, you can take Ampasan now or live with my pass pawn forever. So white will usually take, to be honest. I always thought these positions were only unpleasant sim symbolically, that they were not really a problem. So if he's charging down this, I must I must uh, admit, I don't know why he's aiming for this. And it's already the second time in this match uh, where Magnus goes for an end game right after the opening. So it was game number one where we see an end game uh, in the Roy Lopez and uh, where Magnus played with black pieces and here we see an end game in Petrov where Magnus is uh, with white, yeah. Yes. So if, uh, I, I think that if uh, black manages to solve two problems, well, I would say that uh, one of the problems is the a7 pawn, 
and another one is uh, potentially the d5 pawn because just imagine the knight is not on f3 but it attacks some way like uh, knight comes to e3 yes. uh, so we're talking of some plan like this g3 followed by knight h4 and it, it looks like a long plan and indeed it is but now the knight here this pawn is isolated which means it will have to be defended by a piece um, if he plays a5, I, but I don't, I think that is the main move. Yeah. Well, we are talking very, very few games, but uh, I think a5 is the most popular choice. Yeah, so it would be extremely interesting to know what Magnus prepared here. Yes. Or maybe he because was not... Uh, to me, he's, it looks like he's hurtling down the line with a very, very small advantage. Maybe he just wants to test uh, Jan in that area, see if he can... Uh, a very small edge. He'll try to torture him for a while and see what happens. Or maybe his main idea was to know what's Jan's preparation after e4, and then like for the next game to to choose a more critical line. That's also possible. Yes, it's an expensive way of finding out, but it's uh, <laughs> nonetheless you could be right. Yeah. So he already tried d4 in his first white game, uh, where Jan uh, replied with knight of six e6, and we had Catalan. And uh, here he tried e4. It seems like uh, Magnus' strategy is more like like more like like this in uh, in every match. He's trying to to check what's his opening preparation in different directions. So against Fabiano as well, he switched e4, d4, I think and c4. He started with c4, and there were many English opening. And then there was this there. famous Petrov. And then there was this famous Petrov. But Petrov was maybe game six, six right? yeah. maybe even eight. It was like in the second half of the match, mm -hmm. it feels like. So the first two or three times he tried first move c4, but then he also tried e4, and here again. And in your matches, uh, he mainly played e4. Well, he played e4, but I played the Berlin instead. And uh, the first match, he didn't. He played e4 only at the very end. I mean, I still think a5, and uh, mm, what else can it be? Okay, if we play knight d7, then we don't really have the option of playing a5 after that because the knight is not protecting the pawn. Yes, the problem with knight d7 is it this pawn continues to be weak, so white could uh, protect this pawn. He could bring his king up to d3 and then try to improve his knight. And the thing is, black will have to keep defending the spawn till the end of time. So at least a5 has the advantage. It forces white to take a decision right away. In fact, it's not a hard decision. You will capture here. But yeah, that's because if are. you don't capture, then uh, white also has a weak pawn on c3. Yes. And also, if uh, white doesn't capture once again, then the a pawn is a very strong one. Unless you can bring the knight to the to a4, a4 square, yeah. but that looks... And even if you burn there, black plays knight d7? Yeah, and you're not really killing it. So that's a bit much. I think ba6 if it happens. So knight h4, g6, because I want to stop the knight coming there. And then you play g3. And now the knight c tries to come like this. but. If black does this, white now improves his knight, but black starts counterattacking on this pawn. It seems to me that wouldn't be what Magnus is aiming for. Can he start with rook c8 instead of a5? Well, he can, but uh, probably. But he then doesn't if really I do threaten this, to take. And now, if you do a5. Let me take. You capture with the a rook. And now I could either I could do rook a b one or take and rook b one. I think I'd prefer rook a b one. Ayan has played a five, the most expected move in that position. So rook c eight was not played. And a5 on the board. 
Looks like a good choice for Jan because the position looks safe and also yeah if there is advantage it's it's quite uh, a minor advantage yes uh, also knight h4 g6 played after a5 oh he did not take on a6 um no he didn't and okay F4? this is exciting no i think it's g4 g4 yeah brilliant he wants to well, he wants quite significant yeah Sorry, I, I, this is actually getting slightly exciting. So let's see, g6. What's that? Refresh half. This is actually very profound. Knight h4, g6, and I mentioned this plan with g3, but Magnus is adding a bit of uh, a specific problem to that. He goes g4. What now the same plan that the white knight is going to come here and attack this, but when the black knight defends, so let's uh, make a few moves. Uh, g4, knight d7, knight here. And uh, for instance, this. I g yeah, I should probably I should take this first. Uh, okay, to be honest, uh, it won't illustrate my point very well, <laughs> so I'll, I'll do this another way. If I do this. Just a random move. Then you go knight e3 to attack this pawn. And if black defends the pawn, then now we see the point of advancing the pawn two squares. So that uh, thing, and hey, we may have some life here after all. That's very surprising. Because it's, this is a, uh, at least it looked like Magnus had a specific target. Let's see, let, let's see what you can do. I go knight d7, because I have to go that direction anyway. I don't think he's going to play something like g5 in advance. So let's say knight g2. Let me go knight f6. So now I'm uh, attacking your pawn here. If you do this, I can play bishop f4, right? And before you have time to play g5. And if I exchange my bishop for your knight, that's good as well. So if you make some move like this, I could go here and then try to bring the knight like this whereupon it protects the thing but and and attacks that pawn so but look i'm just shuffling pieces around uh, there there must be a lot of details in this uh, white must have a very specific uh, way of going about it but g4 that's nice uh, has it ever been played before or is this already new? I can check it in my mm -hmm. database where we have more games. But G4 must be, even if there are some games, I am expecting that we don't have many. Mm -hmm. So it's easy for us to say that G4 attacks the F6 knight and thing, but I, I think there are a lot of de details in this. The devil is really in the details. Um, great stuff surprising stuff and are there any other and Jan's, logical moves? Uh, Jan's uh, facial expression doesn't suggest that uh, it seems more annoyed rather than uh, <laughs> okay right he had a kind of exp he's quite confident 97, 97 All right. yeah. 97 I'm afraid there's going to be a lot of correspondence games here or something but anyway for the moment i have not found <laughs> any other reference So black is aiming to trade the rooks, I believe, because uh, then the a-pawn can move forward. And uh, white will try to attack the d5-pawn, though it's not that Magnus very has gone clear. Knight g2, yeah, knight and g2. now He's how will he go about it? So now we may see rook a c8, rook f8, knight f6. Um, after f5, it looks like the logical move, but uh, then we have some problem with the e6 square and also g takes f5. E rook e6 seems very strong. Also, I would add that the bishop f4 might be very strong. 
Yeah, so F5 is weakened in a lot of squares. Yes, I, and maybe even G5 makes sense in a way because uh, this knight has lost the square for which it's fighting so hard to come. Ah, uh, yeah, so and after F4 to play. Rook E6. Rook E6. Uh, rook fc8. Rook fc8. Okay, so it's counterattacking the spawn to gain one tempo. Uh, so let's try a possible sequence of moves. If you go bishop d2, I now do this, but now I'm gaining a tempo with every move. I'm now threatening to attack here. I think f3 is probably forced. And then, like I said, this plan is available. Where the knight comes here, it defends the spawn and attacks the spawn at the same time. So suddenly we realize it's not only black who has a weak pawn. White has one on b5. And if you continue with knight e3, knight c7, c4, then you have bishop f4 idea. Yes. Well, in fact, for knight e3, I could have played bishop f4 so right away if I wanted. And uh, we're eliminating down. So, rook fc8, I suspect something like this might be more what Magnus might have prepared rather than the other one, rather than uh, f3, bishop d2 and f3. Okay, after knight e3, it's very concrete. Yes, so if you take here, knight d5. I mean, I I feel bishop d2 is going to be a bit slow, so this is probably knight e3 now. Or he could try bishop f4, that's also possible. But this looks a bit risky for white. Well, yeah, if, if bishop you know f4, it, then you run maybe. away to f8, and that's uh, perhaps not. Maybe knight e3 here? Yeah, maybe knight e3 is stronger in this position. But let's see if I can capture here. You capture, I take this pawn. How much, be is this really much better for white? I don't know. There is an option of rook e7. Rook, uh, I cannot play rook d8. Uh, just, uh, oh, sorry, uh, I have to go not that far. rook e7. <laughs> and you cannot play rook d8 because then I will do this. And there's a cheapo in the position. <laughs> if you go here. I'll take this, give a check, and take the rook. So, after rook e7, you probably want to step away with the knight somewhere. But black has some nice options as well. He can go knight f6. Mm, g5. g5. Maybe I could start with rook f3. That's a nice intermezzo. Mm -hmm. So I think it's not bishop f4 either. Okay, this is only for uh, rook e7. I could take here. And even though black has this pawns, the knight is very passive. Yeah, and rook e7 on the next move asking where the knight is going. Yeah, actually it's just a transposition to everything. If I go rook, b, rook d3, you just go rook e7. and He has gone bishop f4. He has gone bishop f4. Yeah, and before pressing the clock, just taking some dust away from the board. <laughs> so maybe black should keep the bishop. With bishop f8, the idea suggested initially. Yes, but then it could be that your point that knight e3 might be even stronger than otherwise. So if you capture here, I capture here. And now this pawn is very strong. Uh, your knight doesn't have any squares to go to. It's, this crucial square is taken away. This square is taken away. In fact, it cannot move, except backwards, which is crazy. So bishop f8. I but don't I actually prefer bishop f8 over bishop f4. <laughs> you might be right, because here you have this problem that yeah, with uh, the squares. Uh, knight d5 first, and then next move rook e7, and your knight has to withdraw. But let's see how bad that is. Let me go rook b3. So you go rook e7, right? Likely. Knight I go f8. knight f8. How do you nail this? If I can, I can't play rook b5 yet. No, I can. I thought about knight f6, knight e8, knight e6 maneuver. I am not sure if it works or not. So check, then check. I could play rook d8 or I can just maybe go rook f3 but black is being pushed around a bit uh, instead of rook b3 could I go rook d3 
So let's say, do I need rook e7 or not? Because after rook e7, knight f8, uh, you can continue with uh, knight e6 and then attacking the d4 pawn. Otherwise, if I start with rook a4, you have kind of a move. You can you can make any move. If I do check, check like Anna suggested before, and then I come here. Now I can capture the pawn. And that's an you important. You can even difference. capture both pawns on g4 with a check. Ah as well. yes, and I capture this with check. So suddenly black is just uh, better here. And Jan has played all this very fast. Yes. So the current position is uh, before uh, white played uh, knight e3. It's also the question if it will be played at all, but uh, rook fc8 is the last move. No, I think he played bishop f4, right? Did Magnus play bishop f4? Yeah, he did play bishop f4, sorry. Yes. So what has happened is it's... He has played bishop f4, and Jan has disappeared from the board. Or perhaps, more accurately, has not returned from the waiting room. And uh, we have a question uh, from Leonard. <laughs> Uh, the one who is helping us uh, with the production. So the question is like this. Chess is such a rich game, but now you have traded so many pieces already. And uh, he thinks that uh, the game uh, will not have enough room to press for a win. Why does Magnus play for a small e4 while well, he could play literally anything non-theoretical and just play a normal game of chess? Uh, we also have to ask maybe <laughs> this question is, uh, is to whom? <laughs> Yes, I suspect. Uh, well, why don't you take a shot at it? Uh, uh, so, yeah, if this question is addressed to me, I would say that, um, well, we had a very interesting game number two, where Magnus tried the Catalan, and a uh, very rich game, uh, where uh, we had uh, many pieces on the board, a uh, very sharp game, where both sides has had chances to win the game, real chances. And uh, that was a very spectacular game. Here we have an end game. Uh, but we have already uh, mentioned some of the ideas and our thoughts why Magnus tried e4. First of all, he wants to check in which direction Jan was prepared, like which opening he, he, he was going to choose. And now he sees that it's Petrov. So maybe uh, he didn't really expect Petrov from Jan because uh, usually Jan plays Snyderf. So maybe some of the ideas were mainly focused there. Uh, this is the first thing. And uh, yeah, he wanted to, 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 to see which opening. So this is the second idea of, of Magnus. Yes. Also, I would add that, um, of course, the Petrov is very tough for E4 players, but it's not like D4 players have fun all the time. <laughs> they have their own demons. Uh, Queen's Gambit declines and Ragosins and everything. So there are uh, uh, strong openings in chess, and I think it makes sense for Magnus to spend a white to check this. Also, he actually has a good idea. It may pose problems for Jan that he might not be able to solve today, or he, he may be able to solve but we don't know that. I think uh, it's giving up a little bit early. Uh, the game could still have some uh, story, some drama in it. Yeah, and also uh, Jan could choose any other line earlier. So we could have a game uh, full of pieces. That's right. Yeah, if Jan played something else, uh, who knows what was prepared and, and in which direction and uh, uh, which kind, uh, which type of the position we could have there. And also the third reason we don't know how Magnus feels, and it's his birthday today, so maybe he wanted to be at least safe and play an end game, so uh, to have a calmer game. Yes, but he didn't know in advance that Jan was going to go for the uh, Russian defense. He could have tried uh, Sicilians, Karokans, anything. It doesn't How even have to be solve? a night off. Uh, Jan actually plays the Taimanov quite uh, often. And Khan variations. And Khan uh, variation. So he could have dabbled in anything. Um, 
I think still both players don't know ev everything about the other one's strategy. And so they're still feeling each other out. Of course, they're still trying. Uh, there's no, it's not like only after you find out a strategy, you go home and you solve it. Magnus will, will try to put pressure on him today, try to make him work. But then uh, uh, it will take some time, I think, for both players to hit the weakness of their opponent. And uh, that's some way away yet. Yeah, remember, let's go a few more. Also, we shouldn't forget that uh, White actually can take this pawn. Though after rook b8, it might just not be enough. What other idea is there? Can I go... Knight, maybe rook knight. a4? It looks, as you mentioned, it's I, quite I, strange, I, but uh, here we are. I thought about rook a4, but then I wasn't sure like even about knight e6, knight e6 yes. or rook d8. That's why I, I also thought, like, should I start with rook e7 or play uh, rook a4 immediately? And maybe we show where it comes from because, uh, yeah, this is the current position after bishop f4 and uh, Jan is thinking uh, and we are choosing between the options. We we checked bishop takes f4, we checked uh, bishop f8. And there are only two moves in the position. Unless somebody is going to claim that bishop b8 is possible. It's legal. But it looks really strange. But think about it. I want to play knight f8 or knight f6 or something. And if you capture, then my rook is here for free, which means that I, this pawn is defended. So bishop b8 is an option. Um, but if you play rook is 7 Then I go either knight f6 or knight f8. Let's try knight f8, because the knight has a ready square on e6. So let's try knight f8. I didn't believe we would consider bishop b8, but, but that's what, where we are, yeah? So after rook well, b7? Well, I'm trying to come up with something extra besides... And I'm happy to report, ladies and gentlemen, that there are only three legal moves. <laughs> bishop c7 is not happening, so I don't have any more suggestions for you. But uh, bishop b8 just might work. So rook b7, knight e6, yeah. Yes, if you go here, if you come here, then I gain a move with knight f6. And uh, bishop d2, bishop c7. Bishop d2, bishop c7, and uh, someone isn't coming home tonight. <laughs> when I play knight d8, that rook is trapped over there. Well, we may try a knight e3 and then sacrifice it, but uh, also black can uh, play rook d8. And yes. Rook d8. I don't think you want to take the exchange. But Anyway, we're back to bishop f4. Actually, slowly, I think bishop f8 at least is... Well, bishop f8 is covering the e7 square, so it's more logical than bishop b8. Yeah, but bishop, but bishop f8 doesn't address the problem of knight e3. Uh, but Yankos he even took on f4. Taken, yeah. Wow, he's taken on f4. So he's just trying so That is to obviously trade. the main move, but uh, what does he... Has he worked this out to a draw after rook takes c3, rook d3 or something? And he yes, took on c3? Yes, he's taken on c3. So many pieces are gone. Uh, oh, sorry. Knight takes d5. And. And the only thing we know is that Magnus uh, basically didn't spend time together. Yes. And after rook d3, which I think we were leaning towards in the end. Rook e7, knight f8, we didn't, we didn't really see white's advantage here. Okay, let's try a bit harder here. <laughs> okay. okay. How are we going to do that? Well, I tried harder and I came up with bishop b8, but I haven't tried harder in this position. <laughs> okay, so... Uh,
also maybe rookie seven is not forced. Ah, he's played knight takes d5 and now it's black's move. So rook d3 is one move. Rook b3 we didn't like because of rook e7. It's not really conclusive, but we kind of... Uh, we kick the knight, but it's not easy for black to capture this pawn because white has a fork. Of course, in this particular position, um, you will have rook a7. So if I, if I do this, you take, I fork your rooks, but you pin my knight. But, uh, for instance, after this, I could... Uh, no, sorry. We just got rook some knight of six idea. Yeah. Rook e7, knight f8. I could go rook uh, b7. And now you don't have rook takes b5 because this is there is no more pin. So, in fact, in fact, black loses a rook here. Uh, but maybe black can start with knight e6, uh, rook d8. But then I could check and come here. Rook d5. D5. Can I go in for the... He has gone rook d3. Rook d3, yeah. yeah. It looked uh, slightly better than rook d3. So. And now let's see what Magnus has prepared. Rook e7, rook e7 instantly. instantly. So he's still in his preparation. But to me, I, I'm beginning to get a sense that this is squeezing water from a rock. Uh, Even not from the stone, not from the rock. Yeah. And uh, how is how is Magnus going to be better? He's gone knight of eight. And both of the them. The moves, well, when you don't have any choice, I think. Uh, okay, knight of eight. Uh, yeah, yeah, I understand. But uh, earlier, if uh, Jan Getting didn't here, was, know, yeah. then uh, I think he would have spent more time to get here. So knight b6, rook a4, we also checked knight f6 a bit. And I don't know, uh, what was Magnus preparation? I don't know either. Um, the problem is that after rook d4, rook g4 comes with a check. Yes. If it wasn't about that, then uh, some ideas like knight f6, knight e8, knight d6 could be really interesting. At Magnus, he played rook e7 quite quickly, but after rook f8, uh, after knight f8, he started thinking. Also, in a way, you you find some obscure line, but your opponent blitzes, saying, "You know what? It might be obscure, but I've studied <laughs> it." It uh, throws you off as well. So there's also stuff going on inside their heads, where uh, Magnus must be disappointed that uh, this unusual move didn't surprise him. Didn't surprise him. But he had a right to expect him not to be surprised is another story because, after all, this is the World Championship and their preparation is going to be very good. But... Um, can you try something risky, like knight f6? Oh, no, I don't think it can work. Yeah. Okay, wait, wait. And you I, want to do I, g5 no. and rook c1 or something? Yeah, but if g5 you play knight e6 yes. here, so uh, maybe I start with the rook c1. But then you also have knight e6. You want to do rook c1 here? Yeah, okay. The point is that if rook d4, 
Then knight f6, king g7, g5, and if knight e6, maybe we can take on uh, on e6. Well, just a random idea. Even there, maybe it doesn't work. Just rook takes, takes rook c7, king f8, and well. Okay, we already have a mate in one. <laughs> so. Not there. And if you take this, but if black simply protects his rooks. Yeah, then. This, or maybe even better this. And then yeah, because if that, I, I had some h4, h5 idea. Ah, okay. <laughs> but if this, I, I don't have a, a. No, still I have h4 idea. But somehow it can be stopped by a rook f4. Yes, now I can move the rook sideways. And now white will try to fight for a draw and maybe maybe there is no even draw here. Well, very likely there is no draw. Yeah. So we tried to, to win rook until three, lost. Rook 7 knight of 8. Maybe let's try a knight b6 idea. Okay, so going back to the original plan of taking the pawn, which is our first thing. But uh, if I go rook b8. Yeah, knight c4. Rook takes d4. Knight e5. Rook takes d5. And now you want to play some rook c1. Mm -hmm. Still, I don't see anything after rook e4. And I don't even see something after f6. <laughs> And there is a Twitter message from Lawrence Trent, and uh, he claims that uh, 23rd more rook d3 was still in his notes. Well, good for him. Uh, great, preparation. great preparation. A world championship preparation. <laughs> So now Magnus is taking time and uh, yeah, maybe in his notes, like in Magnus notes, uh, maybe there are like a couple of lines, like some directions which he can try. Uh, but more or less, uh, I, more guess, or less I guess all that leading to. I guess that uh, as soon as Lawrence told the Magnus, he <laughs> went down and wrote it down. <laughs> Rook D3, Lawrence Trent. So Lawrence is international master, I think. Yes. Um, But uh, very entertaining commentator as well. So, so it's quite quite questionable. Yeah. <laughs> no, not at all. He left man once with uh, black. So you started and now you don't know. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm just thinking. Get, get away. No, I'm just thinking. Uh, what you can what say. What is the evaluation and, here? Is, Perhaps Lawrence can also tell us the evaluation <laughs> and simplify things. Okay, the evaluation is very likely is zero, zero, zero. Yes. And knight of fate. There, we can't find even some way. Yeah, unfortunately. Of course, uh, in the blacks problems. Black seems to have fairly sensible, easy to find uh, resources against all Magnus' tries. At least that's what we are struggling with right now. And the position has simplified a lot. Yes. 
so it's not that difficult to play it. Uh, very unlikely you will see a time trouble here. It's like uh, less than less, less than 0.1 percent. <laughs> Moreover, it's small number 24 already. Yeah, very good preparation from Jan. So maybe now we'll go for our first short break and uh, we'll be back with all the action in a couple of minutes. Today, more than ever, when the world comes together to create a better tomorrow. It's going to be... Magic. Oh. Magic. Magic with music. With architecture. With colors. Magic with celebration. With your safety. From here. There. And everywhere. For six whole months, day and night. Join the making of a new world, starting October 1st.
it is time where the beginning of chess history at least will be made he is the challenger from russia jan nipomnesci the world champion from norway magnus carlsen Champion Magnus Carlsen uh, with the black pieces in the first round. Ian Nipomniach with the white pieces in the first round. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. As, as we've seen, Jan will have white, Magnus will have black. The games will begin in two days. And uh, welcome back everyone. Uh, we are in Dubai Exhibition Center where the World Championship match is held. The match between the reigning world champion Magnus Carlsen and the challenger Jan Nepomniachtchi. I'm a grandmaster Anna Mozuchuk here with five-time world champion Vishwanathan Anand and here we see the score of the championship. The first three games ended in a draw. And we still have 11 to go in the classical portion. Here you can see the schedule. So after game three, we had the first rest day. Then we have two more games until the next free day. And uh, speaking about the game, we see that Magnus hasn't made his move. After night f8, well, it was the moment when we went for a break. And uh, the position is still the same. Except instead of squeezing water from a rock, he's now doing it from a stone. <laughs> and he has played knight he's of six. played knight of six. Okay, so enough uh, jokes. Let's see if he's actually managed to find something. Knight of six check. But I would say this is the least likely to work. I mean, at least knight b6 or knight c7, something could happen. But after this, I'm hard-pressed to see what the point could be. Uh, so maybe maybe try to let's try to find some idea with. Uh, I have some idea with rook c1, rook c7. After knight e8, check king g8, rook c1. And then we couldn't really find anything after. Yes, the problem is I play rook takes d4, and even if you get this, I have this check, and back. And rook f4. Yeah. And that takes away the f6 square and the f7 attack, so. I don't see how this is going to work. Ah, maybe, maybe uh, this is what you did, right, earlier. You yeah, did this and G5, knight e6, and I tried some rook e6, but uh, it led nowhere. So actually, I had one more idea. Yes? Uh, can I give it? Yeah, just a few moves. Back. I think he's going to play king g7 immediately, so there's no need to. Okay. Yeah, because G it is false. Seven. I thought maybe knight e8, king g8, and d5. Ah, that is very nice. Okay. Ah, that is nice indeed. But then maybe you play h6 to stop knight f6 g5 idea. Yes. Uh, what else could be done? I could play g5, which then uh, gives the my knight. A route to escape. You always think about your knights. <laughs> it's so nice. I mean, the, <laughs> the knights love you, <laughs> and you love the knights. <laughs> uh, well, it's also because I want to disturb the rook. So it is true that now you could improve the knight's position here. I will go back. Yeah, because if you get if yeah. you go forward, it's dangerous. Your rook c1, rook and c6 if you go rook c1, but now I am able to attack your rook, and I think again I will have enough counterplay. Let's say you go or to b7, b7, then I attack this one. So something like that, just to I might be just in time with this. But uh, yes, knight e8, check, king g8, d5. Uh, 
he did give a check on the ice on 98 played. Yeah. Can, do, uh, can he play king h8? But then uh, he will have issues with 96. Yes, and because then. now I will keep capture here with check. That is one difference. So, okay, this is actually kind of an interesting moment. Is he going to play king g8 or h6 maybe? But I don't see why that should be good. King h6. I still feel that both of them are very much in their prep, so that's why mm -hmm. maybe the... Uh... I think Magnus spent uh, around, I don't know, 20, 25 minutes before he played knight f6, but uh, it, it can easily be possible that uh, it's still... Uh, it was all written in his notes. Yes, uh, sometimes people remember their lines perfectly, and when it comes to the critical moment, you have to decide which of the lines maybe gives... Uh, you the best chances to put some pressure. So he had multiple options, but he has to choose one now. So we expect King J8 here. It's hard to see something else. King G8, D5. Then G5. He has King gone G8, G8 D5. What else after G, G5? I could play Knight D7, for instance. Relying on the fact that if you capture here, I capture your Knight. Or I could play H6, as you mentioned. Which means that this Knight is now able to come out here, and then the F6 square is lost to you. So... Knight D7, Knight D6. You wanted Knight F6. This already... Knight f6, yes, or knight c5. Maybe knight f6 is better, but... No, I, I, I don't... I wouldn't play knight d7. It's just I noticed it's legal. <laughs> yeah, knight d7 looks a bit risky. Because, for example, knight d7, rook c1. And uh, if you play rook d5, I take on d7. <laughs> yes. Don't look at me like this. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> so, I, I, Anna had a nice little trap here after knight d7. She went rook c1. But you have given Because uh, rook takes d7 doesn't work. But after this move, it does work. But um, because of the fork. However, king f8 works as well. So this is not... Well, king f8 I can take here. Yeah, I thought rook e8, rook c7, rook And then rook c7, and then you have rook f3. Okay, so let's get back here. Not rook b7, what am I doing? d5. d5 is possible. What can black do? Can he go h6? You prefer g5. I, I well, there, there is also one move. There is also a move like a4. Just saying do your worst. Because you're not in time anymore to get anything. You, If you go here, I'll go a3. If you go here, I go a2. And I'm simply too fast for you. So you can give this check now, and you can take here, but I am already here to queen. So a4 might be playable as well after d5. Because remember, this pawn is not going to, it's not going to queen. Uh, there's a rook stopping it, there's a knight stopping it. And after a4, you're no longer in time to attack anything, because I'll play a3, and that pawn is very close to queening. And I could play g5 after this move. Mm -hmm. So that could be one option. In fact, Magnus's think suggests that he's wondering whether he should just repeat. Mm -hmm. I mean, d5 is a nice try, but after a4, I'm not even sure that it's 100% equal. I mean, how would you force a draw with white here? I thought about some draw, like, uh, rook, like just I don't know in, in which uh, in which move order, but something like rook c1, a3, knight f6, king g7, uh, g5, a2, rook f7, king f7, rook c7, uh, like knight d7, rook d7, then knight, f, knight f7. Knight okay, that is lovely. So let me show it. Uh, a4. Anna wants to play knight f6 check, king g7, g5. A3, rook c1, 
A2. No, you just asked to find the drawings. <laughs> and you delivered perfectly. I'm uh, showing it because it is very entertaining. And Rook C7 check. And this is in fact a draw. So... Rook takes d7 check, king f8, and now we're going to repeat these moves for eternity. The knight is going to go to h7, back to f6, back to h7, back to f6. So, uh, knight f6, king g7, g5. And what is this accomplished? Now that pawn is protected. So this is one argument for a, h6 instead of a4, where black no longer has knight f6 check and uh, some follow-up. Uh, white. He has to... It might still work out. Let's see, rook c1, a4, I think now it's probably too slow. a3, knight f6 check, king h8, rook f7. And now, in fact, it is black who is too slow. So after h6, rook c1, uh, maybe I should play knight h7 or... Or knight d7, the idea, you had. Or uh, this move, rook f3 or something like that. But h6, I, I don't think it's brilliant. g5 might work, or a4 might work, because uh, even this plan, knight f6 check, king, yeah, it's just uh, a draw plan. g7, g5. I'm wondering, if I start with h6, what are you going to do? Ah, you will give a check, and then take on h6. So if I did this now, you'd give a check and take this first. Who knows? But um, A3, we're not finding more than a draw, right? Unless you do D6 now. Still with this cheapo, but now my knight comes out. That's probably not a good thing. If I had more, one more move, I could try rook e1 and uh, d6, and then rook f7 comes with a checkmate. But uh, yeah, yeah, black is just pushing the pawn. So actually, I don't know. Like, Knight d6 here? In comparison... After a4. Uh, yeah. After a4 you want to take here, yeah, okay. So that now uh, rook d4, like, com comparing to the previous line, it's not rook d4, rook g4. I agree. But if I take these two pawns, where are you threatening any... Yeah. Where is the checkmate in a way is what I'm asking. In fact, you don't even have an entry square. You can go check here. And once again, you're too slow with a3. So that's not going to be it. You pro you have a draw with the repetition, but nothing more. Maybe you can even try King G7. Ah, uh, yes. d 6 King F6. Okay, then maybe White can play G5 before Knight is. Well, White can come here. Now I'm threatening knight e8 check and maybe h f4 g5 mate. So who knows? Rook b4. Rook b4. Now can I go... Rook b5. One second. Let me see if I can finish this. Uh, if I go f3... I'm threatening h4 and landing a mate. I'm also threatening knight e8 check. No, I don't think... Uh, this is very attractive, Okay, yeah, right? that's, a, that's a bit risky. Yes. Uh, so we are in this position, king g8. And he has played play d5. d5, yes, very good. d5. Okay, if he wanted to draw, he, he could have repeated immediately, but yes. he can also repeat after a4. Right. So that's always an option. Not if I play G5, maybe, I don't know. 
Which mode do you prefer, G5 or F4? Yes, that's the question. I mean, part of me wants to play for A4 and uh, tie this uh, rook down to A1. It's not going anywhere. And the other part is voting for, for G5. Because that knight wants to get out. Depends whom you ask. If you ask my rook on A8, he say, come on, let's play A4 first. <laughs> But if I would talk to my... Do you talk to your pieces, Anna? Uh, I am thinking about like uh, how to improve the pieces, but not like uh, what does this piece uh, want. You don't do this, what does this piece want technique? No, okay. In some sense, I am asking like the piece, like, do I want to trade it or where do I want to put it or how to improve the position? So I am asking, yes, some communication uh, between us. But, uh, well, like in this position, uh, I'm not thinking, like, should I play a4 to make my a8 rook happy? <laughs> I mean, after a4, if you play g5, then you no longer have the option of doing that, right? There is no more g5 in the position, so... <laughs> D5. So a little when I'm left in the position, um, but so far I don't see a big problem. I think G5. I must admit, G5 has got this thing that if you give a check here, am I? I can't go out, so I would have to go here. And how to evaluate this? I can go rook b7, right? You come knight g6, I take here. And actually, I'm still not in time to take this pawn. Maybe Wait, maybe I, I will go for a4 after all. Yeah, but did you need knight g6 for that? I thought I will come to f4 and trade something. Mm -hmm. But what else do I do here? I thought it may be, uh, I don't know how relevant it is, just a4, rook b6, rook a5, so that uh, if you play rook a6, then I take on b5. Because otherwise, after knight g6, rook b6, a4, you play rook okay. a6. Okay, rook b6, you want to go rook a5. Maybe I go rook b8, a3, b6, a2, b7. This is possible. A rook b3. Rook b3. Now I go rook a8. I take on b7, I take on a2. Yes. Okay, here White made some progress. Yeah, it's uh, still uh, quite unclear. But I, I'm, I know, I'm now beginning to think that A4 is simpler, and uh, unattractive as it is uh, to leave my knight trapped there. It's actually a good defensive piece, so there's no danger for Black here. And A4, A3. Very direct. Let's see the same idea if it works now. You go Knight F6 check, uh, king g7, g5, a3. Can I go rook b7 here? Can I go rook e3 actually? Because this knight is paralyzed. I didn't think about that. Ah, but you play h6, h4, hg5, hg5, knight h7. And uh, finally it's nice for black to have a pawn here with the rook. Ah, white is not a pawn up, okay, then yeah. it makes no sense. Well, so it all looks a bit fancy, but what is the other idea you have here? If I don't play d6, and I go rook b7, you play a2, rook b6, rook d3, and that is... Uh, here I'm too slow. A4, 
A4, what have we got here? Maybe let's try D6, D7. We don't really believe in it. One second. Let me just do one more thing. Uh, I play uh, knight f6 check, king g7, g5, a3. Suppose I just step up the board, king g2. a2? Let's say a2. Um, maybe h6. Ah, h6, knight e8, yeah? Okay, it's confusing, but let's do yeah. this like this. Then h6, h4, takes... Or maybe h6 already I can do this check. But now king h7 is... No, ah, king h7 as well, but even this I think now, because now your rook has to go back again and everything is looping a lot. Um, but you're right, king h7 is much simpler. Then it's only a draw. So h4, you capture... I capture, you play knight at seven. Still dead. A4. A4. Let's see what was Magnus' idea because he spent quite a lot of time before knight of six, so I think here he will play faster. <laughs> Magnus was a bit angry. Something was wrong what with What if I got d6? Yeah, d6, uh, that's what I asked you. And, uh, oh, sorry, then uh, I was. Uh, Fooling around with this other line. If you go a3, then you play d7. Yes. And now you're threatening knight f6 check and rook e8. Yes. Right. But are you threatening anything? What if I come rook a4? Are you threatening anything besides the draw, I'm asking? I can still try knight f6, rook e8. Then you have... No, I have knight takes d7, don't I? Oh, yeah. Sure. A4. Okay, maybe let's try g5 there. Like... Uh, yeah. D no, d6, a3, d7... And d7, g5. Yeah. And if I take that. Okay, I thought rook a3, but. Uh. I did not see that. I mean, I kind of walked into walked into that, didn't I? King f1, rook g5. So I can't do that. G5. Can I do? Maybe I can attack it with my knight, like that. And then I think you want to do this, right? And threaten mate. Is it so clear after knight f5? Well, either you do this, you capture this thing, I take, take, king f6, and you take this pawn. But I suspect we will end up uh, exchanging this pawn for this pawn, right? So I can go knight e, I can go uh, king g7, rook takes b6, and now check, knight d4, and I'm threatening to come here and so on. That looks like a draw. Yeah, essentially we will get some position like this, uh, where you can no longer defend the pawn, because I will just uh, but here... attack it. Uh, how will I attack it? Knight no, knight c2 here. is okay. Rook a2? Ah, and uh, rook b2, rook a3. Yes, and you can do that. So, rook a2, and how do I figure this one out? I think knight uh, b3 should be enough. 
Ah, no, then you have rook d1. I don't believe this, but anyway, let's just see where this is going. King g2. Maybe I should just step here and see what's going on. Maybe, yeah, the same idea, but with the knight on d2, like in f, knight f3, king g2, rook knight d2, rook a6, rook b4, uh -huh. and to, uh, to bring the knight to c4, if necessary. Yes. So basically what we are trying to prove is that this position is drawn because uh, even though black is an exchange down, he has an extra pawn. But I think g5, if I don't do anything, I shouldn't be in any danger. So I don't know why, uh, maybe I don't need to panic. Oh, you're threatening knight f6 and uh, rook e8, right? Oh, by the way, there's a very simple draw here. Rook g4 check, king f1, rook g5, ah, rook a3. What was my idea? Was it rook d4? Oh, then rook a8. No, that's not correct. I could give a check and go from here. Then you give a check with the other rook and I lose the house. Yeah, no, I don't want that. Okay, this is getting a bit chaotic. Hang on. G5. You also have rook 8d4. And now we are really threatening to take it, right? But, but knight f6, king g7, rook e8. But you're not threatening anything. So. I have enough rooks to control d8, so I'll play h6. h4? Can you play g h6? You can play, no, g h6 you take with the king. Ah, but then I do rook d8, king g7, forking the two pieces, but you have d8 queen. Just escaping. Uh, so rook e8, okay, I don't want to touch h6. What do I want to play? kind of landed in the soup with this one. So g5. But maybe then in that line rook d4, knight f6, king g7, uh, rook e8, if you just uh, rook play rook d1, trade the rooks and uh, a2. Uh, sorry? Where, where? Like in that line, we discussed rook uh, a to d4, knight f6, king g7. Rook e8? Uh, rook d1. Ah, okay. Okay, take, that take, uh, king g2, a2, and well, rook a8, and then when white takes on a2, we take on d7. Or we play h6 uh, in that position after rook okay. 8. Or is it a bit unclear after h6, h4? Black kind of ha has no moves. But I can't, I just so go yeah, just, uh, yeah, just, yeah, rook somewhere and then a1. Yes. Or 
go. This looks like a draw. Yes. Our Magnus gave a check. So, so after a4, a4 uh, knight of 6 check. check. And after king g7, he'll go g5. Or he will repeat and then play something else. Uh -huh, sure. Yes, he could also go back to, he could repeat one more time and play g5. And like this, build it up, yeah. <clears throat> If I play a3, then you have the ability to check and transpose. Sure. Are we discussing d6 here? I, I tried d6 with the knight on e8. Maybe it's more or less the same, because we can always play knight a8 back. Yeah. Yeah, no, this was the position we were looking at, knight e6. And what did we discuss here? D7? At least Jan's moves are easy. <laughs> King has only one square most of the time. King G7 and G5. G5, okay, so we are here. And this is the position we've analyzed extensively. Did he play A3 yet? Not yet. So this is the current position. And we're waiting for Jan's move. Is he going to play hit six, a three? A six we didn't really want because of knight e eight. But even that line. Okay, that line, uh, yeah, h six, knight e eight, rook eight, and she takes h six. So a3 is the one, but it looks okay. Yes. Also, he, he's a Grunfeld player. Uh, yeah, in Grunfeld. So he you're knows <laughs> the pass pawn on d5 against the pass pawn on a3 is a common motive there. And actually, it looks like a Grunfeld finally. It reminds Look, us of a the king of g7. Usually there's a, a, a bishop on g7. No, but the, that bishop often gets exchanged. So we're finally back in a Grunfeld kind of thing. It's except that white should normally have lost his b5 pawn as well. <laughs> uh, but other than that... Okay, well, Jan is thinking. Uh, maybe I can ask you a couple of questions from my followers. Actually, yesterday on my Instagram page, I uh, made an announcement that uh, if he, if my followers wanted to ask something to Vishy, uh, they were able to do so, and <laughs> Vishy agreed. So thank you for that. And uh, let me ask you the most interesting questions. Uh, so the question coming from uh, Vashishta. Uh, apart from chess, which is uh, the other game you like the most? And also a similar question from Edward C. So what are your hobbies? Okay. Uh, it's funny to be suddenly switching to interview mode <laughs> uh, from commentator mode, but uh, let's see. But you know, I started to interrupt you. I got like a really long list of questions, so I just I'll just pick some of them. Okay, um, I like watching football. I like watching tennis, and I follow even other sports. Maybe not all with the same intensity and regularity, but I follow a lot of sports. Hobbies: I like traveling. Uh, one of the things I like sitting and reading about is astronomy. Mm -hmm. Those are some couple of my hobbies. It's like uh, astrophysics, uh, I heard, uh, was one of your... Astrophysics is probably a bit strong, but I like reading on the subject. So 
I mean, I had this phase when I would uh, try to take some equipment out into the field and look at the stars and so on. But uh, now I like reading about the subject. Ah, okay. Yes, astrophysics. Good. And the game? Do you like any game, particular besides chess? Uh, I mentioned so football. But you tennis. mentioned like watching. I don't and play. I don't, I don't play, play uh, too many sports. I mean, I, I play tennis uh, occasionally, but uh, I should play more often. <laughs> Okay, Jan played day three. This is the move which we expected. So maybe a couple of more questions. Uh, so v the question from uh, Fjeldus, uh What is your favorite game that uh, you played? I mean, you can name a few. Also, that would be also great. Uh, how do you how do you answer that? It's very difficult. Yeah, I, you have played thousands. Yeah, I've played really a lot of games, but. Um, If you want some recent material in uh, in Croatia, there were a couple of games with uh, uh, Korobov. I think, especially one French, I thought my pieces really played very well. It was a blitz game, but nonetheless, uh, uh, that French I liked uh, a lot. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, great. So your game against Korobov is uh, uh, highly advised. <laughs> it's, a ni it's a nice game. I think it's one of my better French defenses. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, top three greatest players of all time. You can name more. You can name less, as you wish. Actually, many people are interested in that. Yes, but I I don't understand the question at all, and honestly, I have no idea. <laughs> uh, I mean, I usually just say Fisher, but honestly, it's just very tough to compare people of such different eras. Uh, first of all, it's very difficult to compare Fisher with because uh, he was. Pre-computer, but even let's say pre-rapid chess. Yeah, you can never and know then, what uh, would happen if he had uh, right. the access to all the and then, things. Um, I mean, while I'm, I'm really, really impressed by Magnus's performance in let's say uh, rapid and blitz. Uh, you can can hardly compare that with Kasparov because he didn't have he simply didn't rapid and blitz was not that common then. Yeah, sure. And so on, and so these things keep on changing. Uh, okay, uh, some uh, uh, funniest story. Regarding chess, uh, I don't know. You tell me. You tell him because you're laughing all the time at me. <laughs> but, I, not at you, but I just enjoy the commentary. <laughs> ah, okay. No, um, I mean I'll tell one story which went, which of course went into my book. Uh, I was a very young grandmaster, a very new grandmaster, India's first grandmaster, and I was traveling in a train, and uh, there was a man who asked me. My fellow passengers. Uh, this was the time before phones. Of course, people spoke to each other, and uh, I he asked me, uh, "So, young man, what do you do?" And I told him, "I'm a chess player." And I kind of uh, expected I him to story. be surprised. That, that's yeah. a wonderful story. Yeah. I expected him to be surprised, but what the hell? He said, "Oh, okay, but what do you do?" <laughs> so I I gritted my teeth <laughs> and I said, "No, no, I'm really a chess player," because. I was very proud that I was going to be a professional player, and I thought. Then he said, um, "Do you have a job?" He probed around a bit, and then finally he told me, "You know, young man, uh, sports is a very risky career. Uh, if you were Vishnuadhan Anand, you could then probably you make, a make, living, living you can make a living playing chess. But uh, otherwise, uh, otherwise, it could be, it could be risky. Uh, and and yeah, I mean, how do you beat a story like that? Yeah, I've never come close." <laughs> and you didn't tell him anything. No, of course I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Then after that, you were speechless. I hope he has bought my book by now, but who knows? <laughs> I'm sure he has heard the story by now if he's around. Yeah, sure. Uh, one more question. Um, thanks to what? Uh, th thanks to what? In your opinion, you became the world champion and the top level player. What was your strength like? And uh, the I, most important ability. I, I would like to say just sheer talent, but uh, but maybe you worked a, a little bit. <laughs> it's probably a mixture of things. Yes, you work, you try. Uh, I was lucky uh, in my circumstances. I had a lot of uh, people who really uh, gave me a lot of support, uh, especially my wife. You know, uh, she was with me in all the uh, matches we played, and that kind of support and. Of course, enables you to think a lot about chess. 
uh, I managed to work with some great people. Again, it's very difficult to re reduce it to one thing. But yeah, of course, it's try. the com combination of many right. factors. It, a lot of things came together, really. Yeah. Ah, great. Uh, many people are interested. Uh, how did you overcome the difficult periods uh, in your life, or uh, what is the best way to, uh, you know, forget about the loss after the tournament? But uh, in general, how, how, how to motivate yourself after uh, after something goes wrong? I wish there was a technique. I mean, most of the time I would say you just, you live with it. Uh, losses are a part of life. That doesn't mean it becomes any easier. And uh, it ha I hate it as much today as I did uh, at any time. But it's a part of life and uh, you go to sleep, you wake up and the nice thing is after a couple of days it diminishes and you can start to look forward. Of course, there were periods in my career when I was completely stuck as well. It seemed like you couldn't make any progress. Uh, you feel like you've hit a wall. Those are more frustrating. Once again, I would say, uh, first get back your desire to play, your desire to uh, enjoy chess. And then after that, if you do some work, usually at some point things turn around again. Uh, the nice thing is if you have enough experience, you know everything uh, will change. The good times will end, but the bad times will also end. Yeah, it's it's always changing. And is it important to always have a goal and uh, try to reach it? Yes, I think uh, having a goal helps you focus helps on many you. things. You, you you need you need a goal to focus. Even it doesn't have to be some life thing. Even a goal like I'm going to be positive for the next hour is a kind of goal which gets you through that. So. Yeah, I think um, these are great advices. Uh, also, many people also, I mean, I am asked this question very often, uh, what, uh, what is your favorite chess book? And uh, maybe you can divide it by opening, middle game, end game, strategy, tactics, or you can just name uh, one or two which you like the most and uh, which perhaps helped you the most to uh, improve your chess level. Well, the, there are chess books that I studied when I was very young. Um, there are chess books you grow out of. In a way, it's a bit like, uh, I think Bent Larson said, uh, uh, there are things that, uh, they're like ladders. You use them to climb up and then you kick them away. Uh, it's like and for it's, every it's, level, so it's evolved, also, it should be you short sorted. out of it. But uh, certainly, good games, when I was very young, good game collections of the great players like Capoblanca, Spassky, Tal, and so on, motivated me to uh, at least try to play like them. Uh, later on, I studied a mixture of uh, opening books, uh, opening uh, books, and uh, right now I feel uh, the most useful are game collections. So you, you get a bit of everything. Uh, if you see a top player's games, then you'll, uh, or any well-written book, in fact, uh, about games, you'll have a bit of everything. It's, it's very difficult to. Uh, break chess into openings, middle games, end games, because in our time, they combine much all the time. Yeah, and uh, like sometimes you're starting the opening, but then it also uh, turns out that you're in the middle game position, but it's still theoretical. And uh, also you have to think about the end game, which are rising uh, often uh, from, from that particular middle game. So yeah, the theory is developing a lot. And it also, uh, there is a connection to the next question, which I think is uh, very also very interesting for me. So uh, how do you think the opening theory will look like in the future? Maybe I'll rephrase it a little bit. Uh, like from year to year, we have to memorize more and more lines and the opening preparation is longer and longer. So let's say, I think it's already a big difference between uh, these times and uh, let's say even just 10 years ago which may seem not a long period of time, but I think uh, the preparation is quite different and we have to spend much more time memorizing the lines. But just imagine 10 years from now, later in the future, how will uh, people uh, memorize it? Will they still try to, you know, uh, try to memorize all the lines or they will try to do it in a different way? Well, I think it's useful having some perspective about this. It's not the first time we have heard these complaints. So, Capablanca used to complain that the game is dying is that, out. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, he said, we know everything there is to know. And thing. So, 
we do find ways forward. Definitely the pressure of technology and uh, opening theory just keeps piling up and up. Having said that, uh, every year it feels like that. And somehow the game copes and we move on. Um, it's true that right now the theory feels very oppressive. But um, at the same time, every for every door which closes, a new one opens. So I, I understand the frustration of the question almost. But uh, somehow chess has coped and it will. Yeah, of course, people and will have to adjust and find and some ways how yes, to do Yes, and it. of course, uh, you will have to keep uh, modifying the format and so on. It may well be uh, that this trend of opening uh, computer opening work pushes faster and faster time controls to create this unpredictability again. So, you know, we'll find some solution. But um, uh, it has to be said that even now people make interesting uh, discoveries and... Um, On the we early find new stages. and interesting and early stages and new and interesting lines are also coming up. Yeah, so that's very possible. I, I completely agree with you. Uh, there is also a question from the person I believe you know quite well, uh, Ashvin Sobramanyan, mm -hmm. a great supporter of Indian chess, and uh, he is actually uh, working a lot in the uh, biotechnology field. Uh, so his question is: uh, as a commentator, how would you use via feedback data, such as player heart rate, if available. But well, I think it's not only about uh, commentator, but just in general. Yes, I mean, obviously snapshots uh, are interesting when um, at a certain moment, if you, you may think the position is completely fine, but if you realize the player's heart rate contradicts that, <laughs> yeah, goes then up that is useful them. information. So you think... Well, either he doesn't know what we know, or we don't know what he knows, or some, you know, there is some gap, and some that is the interesting thing. Then the second thing is the trend line. So if you take the heart rate for the entire game, for the entire tournament, and you compare different ones, then eventually uh, you'll get interesting differences between variations between the players, and you think, ah, okay, I didn't. It's always that you come up with some new observation. You think, ah, oh, it's interesting. This guy looks nervous as hell, but in fact his heart rate is low. Uh, the other one uh, seems to be uh, calm, but he's more. Wi so you look for that thing that surprises you, and I think that's the only thing you can do with this kind of data. Uh, yeah, and for the chess player themselves, I think they can use them uh, like this data to understand in uh, which uh, mode, in which shape they perform the best. Yes, very much. I mean, uh, we have to try. You have to try and understand yourself completely. So every little bit matters, what helps you perform, what doesn't help you perform. And uh, when should you be worried and when shouldn't you be worried? I think it comes down to that. And also try to work on this field, like how to control your emotions, how to calm down, or how to be more focused uh, instead of being uh, relaxed if it's uh, bad for you to be really too much relaxed. Yes, I mean, essentially objectivity. You, you take that observation and decide, is it good for me or bad? Should I improve or should I keep it as it is? Okay, Magnus still hasn't played anything, so just uh, two more questions for you. And uh, the first one is, uh, well, nowadays many people are talking about uh, Alireza Firuja, uh, the young star, originally from Iran, but now living and representing, uh, living in France and also representing French Federation. He has become world number two. And uh, many people are asking about uh, what do you think about his potential and uh, will he be able to be the next world champion? Uh, he is one of the most exciting and talented players we have seen in a long time. I share the, I share the entire chess world's excitement about him. I think he has every right to try for the next world title, but of course there are no guarantees. I mean, still he will play... He'll play, strongest, the he'll play the strongest players in the world in the candidates. He, he has won the Grand Swiss tournament yes. recently, so and he's he already qualified to. for the next uh, candidates tournament, That's right. which so is a great achievement. He will have to uh, earn his way there, like everybody else, but uh, his talent is... Uh, I mean, it takes, it, you see that only very few times. Yeah. And uh, now uh, the question, I am sorry if I will mispronounce it, but... Uh, Ahil Yapo Tournaments La Parkalam. 
What ah, actually okay. means, means when a, we, when can, can we see, see a heel your son in the tournament? A kill yapo tournament la paklam. Papom papom. Idhar ko arindu varshma vete kulye arindu. Tere yadi. So what I said was. the last two years he has been stuck at home playing but maybe he'll play a tournament but <laughs> he he likes chess he plays it uh, quite often and right now he enjoyed his trip to calcutta to watch the tournament so we'll and he's 10 years old and he's 10 and a half yeah great <laughs> and the very last question uh, from spade uh, how is it to commentate with me <laughs> <laughs> it's good fun it's good fun we uh, I think we work well together as a team. You know, uh, we divide our responsibilities. Our and, mission. Uh, I am laughing. You are showing the lines. That's that's the important <laughs> aspect, but also um, uh, you kind of try and uh, see the uh, the doubts that you have. You pose them to me. I pass a question back to you. We go back and forth, and I think. Uh, Uh, as we struggle to understand the game we hopefully convey what the players are actually also <laughs> going through though they are better prepared <laughs> avisha thanks a lot uh, thanks for answering these questions sure. and i am sure many of my followers will appreciate it a lot thank you so much <laughs> and uh, meanwhile we didn't miss anything because after a3 magnus is still thinking so it was a good period to ask all yes, these questions yes i think your draw still works rook c1 a2 rook uh, f7 is still there if Yeah, maybe we can show this line as many uh, as maybe some of the viewers uh, have just joined us and they didn't see what so we I, were showing. So I asked Anna to find a draw, and on demand she found one. She went rook c1, a3, rook takes f7 check, king takes f7, rook c7 check. The king has no squares, so you have to clear it by sacrificing a knight. You take, and despite all this brilliance, all that happens is we get to a perpetual check. So if you have any requests for Anna you also <laughs> please send them on and now on, on Instagram phone, Instagram <laughs> and she of will Avishi, all the questions find a win please. find a win for black find a winner whatever she will deliver but this was the draw we found to be honest we don't see really how magnus is going to uh, break through so a draw is the most likely result and um, uh, we were trying different things but I mean D6 for instance is a reasonable try but um I no after 96 were we happy or not I think maybe we were having 96, doubts anyway right D7 Yes uh I think we checked D6 with the knight on E8 does it make any difference now if it do it Probably not because I'll come back to F6 with check right Yeah like yeah Yeah and uh, look we didn't see a major try Besides D6, we didn't actually have any other ideas. That's true. I tried Rook E3, but that's not for a win. Oh yeah, Rook E3, then we trade the Rooks, uh, and then H6, H6 yes. Knight. It's an idea. This I remember. Okay, now we are going for another short break. and uh, we believe that uh, when we are back magnus will play a move and uh, we will see the direction and then discuss it so stay tuned
today more than ever when the world comes together to create a better tomorrow. It's going to be magic. With music, with architecture, with colors, magic with celebration, with your safety. From here, there, and everywhere for six whole months, day and night. Join the making of a new world starting October 1st. And uh, welcome back, everyone. Uh, let me remind you that it's the fourth game of the World Championship match between Magnus Carlsen, the reigning world champion, and the challenger, uh, Jan Nepomniši. And actually, before we went for the break, we had exactly the same position. So A3, the last move. And uh, Magnus has been thinking for quite long. I think it's the longest uh, period uh, he has uh, spent most time on this move than uh, on on the previous moves he has made in this match uh, and uh, I don't know if he can actually come up with some ideas uh, because many of the ideas uh, we have tried actually if he wants he can force a draw with knight e8 king g8 knight f6 king g7 back and repeat the moves this way but if he has spent more than half an hour on that move he's definitely trying to find some idea and maybe he has some ideas just uh, uh it's uh, quite unclear, unclear how to make them work so right now we are here we also try some d6 ideas uh, after knight e8, with the knight on e8, with the knight on f6, uh, but uh, we couldn't find a way how to how to pose real problems. Hard, 
Let's give it a shot as well. I think he's still repeating twice, right? Uh, it's the first time he has repeated, so after... Uh... Yeah, no, the position will repeat twice, so it doesn't matter is what I meant. It's like this and ah, he yeah, comes he tried, back, yeah. yeah, he tried... Uh... No, but he tried knight f6, then he played g5, and after g5 he only went knight e8, so it was not knight f6, knight e8 immediately. Correct. No, I mean that after a3, g5, a3, it'll happen twice. The knight will be on uh, f6 again, that's all. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I think he's checked it, so <laughs> he's still going to... So, knight e8, king g8 will be played. Yeah, let's go back to d6 again, let's see if there is some life we can... You want to try d6 or with the knight on f6? Or with the knight on e8? I would guess you have to do it with the knight on f6 because if you do it here, then I have knight e6. And what is the difference? If you do this now, I can go here. Can't yeah, I? Yeah, through after king, knight e7. Then I take... Yeah, that's okay, but knight d7, knight e5? Yeah, so you want to do this. Now I can I can go here if I want, if I want knight e5 to be less effective. Probably I should do that. Then if you come here, I just take the pawn. Ah, and you still ha uh, you do this, and I now have this move. So That's nice. Yes. So, knight... Uh, I think it'll have to be here. And now, maybe knight e6, as mm -hmm. we mentioned earlier, right? And d7. Threaten a rook e8? Yes. Can I, can I take this move? This one? Yes, uh, rook e8. And then let me go, for instance, rook e5. Actually, Magnus is repeating with knight of 6 well, now he has a chance to play d6. That's it. I mean, he can't do it once more because he can't come back. So that's the line yeah. we actually had, uh, I don't know, one hour ago or maybe yes. even more. So d8, queen. A rook takes d8, a rook takes d8, king f6, a rook d6. No, but now I put the rook on a5. As earlier, I think it was on a4. Yeah, sure. So it's I think now it's going to be a, just a draw. A if you take this, I will give a check. It doesn't matter where you go. I go on. here and game over. It's just a draw. So. Uh, so let's see. Anyway, we are now here. So I, I think it has to be d6. Oh, sorry. We are now here. And if not d6, then I don't see what else. But Magnus, Magnus has spent like half an hour, so so he was definitely calculated something. Sure. Let's see. <laughs> now is the moment. Will he repeat or he will try to continue the game? Yes, maybe he just decided to repeat once to uh, to get closer to the time trouble. <laughs> Funny question from Leonard. One more. Uh, Misha, do you think, uh, looking at uh, Magnus' face and his face expression, do you think he's enjoying his birthday? <laughs> Magnus turned uh, 31 today, so it's, he's playing his first game uh, of the match on, uh, on the day of his birthday. And uh, here we can see Magnus' father, Henrik, uh, on the right. And also his uh, sister mm -hmm. in, the, in the yellow t-shirt. And it's also uh, his birthday cake. 
Ah, Here okay. we have it zoomed. So 31. And look at this Magnus, cute Magnus. <laughs> I think you may even remember him when he was uh, when he looked like that, more or less. And in the background, you can see a book, uh, a new photo book on Magnus, published by New in Chess. Oh, this is a nice cake. A really nice one. Yeah. <laughs> I believe it was prepared by the organization team, so it will be a good present for Magnus. So even if he didn't enjoy this game so much, he will enjoy the cake more. Yes, it's, I mean, they probably do requests and uh, maybe they they know what his favorite cake is. <laughs> <laughs> so. It doesn't look like uh, he's very happy about his position. Oh, but also no reason to be very sad. Well, he lost, uh, if he makes a draw now, yeah, he kind of lost uh, the white color, one game with mm -hmm. white pieces. Uh, on the other hand, uh, he now knows uh, what's, uh, what is uh, Jan's uh, uh, weapon against E4. So qu quite an expensive. <laughs> Well, unfortunately, <laughs> there's only one way to find out uh, what yeah, uh, what you're going to face with the white pieces, and uh, it's much more expensive with a defeat. <laughs> believe me, so it's much better to find out with a draw than with a loss. But I, I'm running out of ideas. I mean, d6 is the only thing I can come up with, and in both lines, knight e6 and uh, problem solved, I guess. Um. Okay, I had a bit crazy idea, but still the idea. Just a second, uh, can we go a few moves back? Yeah. Like after knight of six, king g7. Can I play h4? If you play h6, I want to play knight e8. If you play h2, I want to play h5. And I don't know. Okay, you take, take, king g8. And my knight comes to g6. And I didn't even have to work for it. <laughs> <laughs> also, what about h5? Does it actually matter? Where can it help? Well, now if I play d6, you don't have knight d6, knight g5. <laughs> that is true. After one hour, we found one idea. Yes. <laughs> it's true. I I mean, I was kind of trying to make knight at 7 work, but why give the f7 pawn? So probably there is a better move than h5. What could that be? Yeah, but uh, as I said, uh, I don't see the point. What if I, I what if I do that? But it's very slow yeah. to capture it like this. No, I, I don't. I cannot play rook a four. A two maybe, just to threaten rook b three. But you now you even have rook e two. I think attacking the pawn. Because the clamp here is very strong. Okay, so let's try this uh, h4, h6 after all. And if you play like uh, rook e2, rook b3, takes, 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 rook b5, d6, check. What's that, rook b3 here? Yeah. No, I thought uh, a2, rook e2, rook b3, but uh, well, then the d pawn may be strong. Yeah, no, I wouldn't uh, do that, no, mm -hmm. because uh, my pawn is much further along than yours. Yeah, I thought that after d6, maybe we have. Uh, Rook B1, Rook D1, but yeah, it, uh, anyway, but you it's have like the, White it's took the important pawn and yes. uh, we gave the B5, which is... Uh, but H4 is a good try because at least it passes it back to Black and says, what are you going to do? Okay, let's play H6. 
I, I, we have made this mistake before, hit 698. Uh, it's easy to think that white has to capture and you capture, and perhaps that is a draw. But uh, of course, this would be an intermezzo where you get to move this first. Maybe that's a draw anyway. Can I draw like this? It's kind of grovelly, but. Well, the first question is uh, if black needs it. Yeah, Absolutely so. doesn't. <laughs> I am just uh, incidentally, I could go here. Take. I come here. So I'm threatening King F8. Where do you go? Maybe knight d6, rook takes d5, knight takes f7. And then, oh, okay. But I still I don't see the... a2? a2, then knight e5, and I'm threatening rook g7 check uh, with I a saw, mating idea. I no? saw that after rook b5 you have knight d6 and then rook g7, but uh -huh. after knight, uh, rook d5 yeah. I didn't see knight e5. So that may not be very nice if you go knight d6. But if you play like very, very passive rook f8, yeah. is it so bad? No, not at all, because this pawn is now cannot be saved. So you're absolutely right that uh, protecting this pawn. And, and my knight is threatening to come back into the game. So you can have one more round with the knight. You take this, I take, you go here. And of course, if you go okay. here, then I okay. just take this. And? <laughs> and then there is a check maybe. Yeah. So uh, but if you it don't goes like this, and then check. Knight is forced here. And now you do not capture with the rook, but you do that. And it's going to be checkmate after this. That was a beautiful idea. I mean, it's scrap, scraping the bottom of the barrel here, but also I could play knight f6 and do it in a more active way. And then all these moves, are, problems are solved. So knight b6 just... Uh, or b8? Yeah, knight takes d5. Oh no, then you go pin me with rook b7. But knight b6, rook b8, yes. And h7 even can just uh, Uh, can we try knight c7? Yeah, then I wanted to go rook c8. I don't really believe in it, but... Okay, d6. I mean, maybe I'll even play the rook to d8 and take it with this pawn afterwards. Mm -hmm. One move. So, it just. Maybe h6 is also a draw. Though h4 was a good try because it forced black to confront this. Still, we saw nothing wrong with a2. Yeah, the rook e2, you're going to double behind it or what? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I can play d6. Isn't it just a little bit unpleasant? Yeah, it may be. Yeah. Okay, then can we can we look it again? H6 check.
maybe some idea after night with seven. Where? D6 or what? D6 doesn't help. D6, 8 takes G5. And 96 and, and black is just uh, better even. No, it's not better. Okay, D7, Rook 8 it's, it's still there, but... Uh, I don't even know if... Uh, D7 rook of 8 or something is possible, but there's no need to try it, right? So maybe uh, H6, knight E8? Yeah. And after knight H7, like G takes H6, knight H7? like we are struggling but Magnus is struggling even more mm -hmm. well he actually has to be sure it works before he plays it we on the other hand can enjoy ourselves and All try right. it <laughs> yeah he played 98 so he, I think it's repeating yeah it's like repeating for the second time in this position yeah so 98 king g8 Knight of six, king g7. I think. Yeah, it seems like he will repeat because he yes. almost spent uh, too much time and uh, just repeat twice. I think we can conclude. Uh, once you do it twice, you're probably just going to give up. Yes, because actually, after knight e8, king g8. Knight f6, can black already claim a draw with claim king a draw g7, yeah. yeah. Because we would be in this position, which will happen on move 29, on move 31, and again uh, on move uh, 33. <laughs> Maybe there was the only hope that Jan fell asleep <laughs> while waiting for, <laughs> for his move. But okay, well, he's he back. Yeah. Knight f6, king g7. And now Jan is claiming Jan, Jan just, okay, let's finish this game. Yeah, draw is agreed. Yeah. Well, what we can say about this game was that uh, Jan's preparation was actually very good. And let's listen to the players and their conversation. Yeah, I think it's, it sounds like 0 0 0 Yeah, d6, 96. d7. Can I just find rook h? No problem. Rook e8, rook f4. Ah, here just not. Then rook j8. Mm -hmm. You already took the point. No, but I just five. Uh, I mean, immediately d6. d6, 96. Ah. And d7, 95. Yeah. Yeah, rook e8, I mean, even here, rook e4, d8 promotes. So yeah, it takes six, 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 and f6. But then rook b6, rook b6, rook b6, and rook b6 at some point. It should be okay, maybe I can do, yeah, go to free on two. Maybe I should go to free on two at some point. But I also had like interesting move, like knight to six, and let's say d7, rook d8, something like rook d8, and then h6. And somehow it's not so easy. I mean, maybe that's just unnecessary, so I should just try to try the way. I mean, rook d8, you can also take on d7. Right? Yeah, I mean, okay, a lot of moves, but yeah. I mean, maybe you can keep b5 all, I wasn't sure. So. Yeah. Yeah, so they were actually discussing this line, and Jan uh, seemed surprised that Magnus didn't try it. Um, and essentially, it's what we saw. Knight takes g5, rook e8. And Magnus said rook a4, which we in, did as for, at first as well. But you see that later on, we realized that this move draws much more easily. Because it's attacking the b5 pawn. Yeah. The only thing would be if uh, white wants to throw in this check first, and then capture here. Trying to spoil the structure because it may be important yes. when all the pawns on the uh, queen's side are gone. But 
probably black should uh, take it with the king to not spoil his pawn structure. And now there is nothing to recapture. So this pawn is uh, under attack. You have to defend it like this. And then I just step, step back. And my knight goes to the square and it's a draw. So both ways this was uh, finished in a way. So the knight h5 and also they discussed the line when uh, white takes the pawn on b6. After d6, rook d8, rook d8, king f6, rook d6. What's that? Sorry, b d6 where? Uh, like a uh, queen. Queen here instead of knight h5. Yeah. So they briefly discussed this line, rook d8, rook d8, king f6, rook d6. Six, yeah. uh, white takes the pawn on uh, b5. Uh, but apparently after uh, king g7, uh, rook b6. We thought this is a dead draw because um, even though black is an exchange down, uh, he has such good squares for his knights that uh, nothing much is happening here. So the only important thing is that uh, we are controlling the b5 pawn. Because, for example, if white king was, let's say, on c4, it would be completely winning for white as uh, white wins the a pawn, and we are not giving our b5 pawn. But when uh, these pawns are traded, like uh, black takes the pawn on b5 and uh, white takes the a3 pawn, it's just a dead draw because, uh, yeah, the knight has uh, many outposts on f5, on h5. I believe also e6 is quite a good square. And, uh, well, there is no way white can penetrate and uh, pose any problems. So quite a solid draw today. Yes. And uh, I, I think, uh, well, they have to move to d4. Uh, both, both of them, them, you believe both of them? Should yes, in a way, because they both... Uh, Young has Finding it hard to, yeah. But, uh, no, maybe I'm... I don't know how many other interesting ideas one can find in the Petrov. I mean, Magnus uh, tried his best against Fabiano as well and uh, didn't get anywhere. So, today was actually a reasonable idea. It's first, at least it's new. With G4? But with G4 and Knight H4 and G4, this was clever, but... Uh, so I think it the seems moment, that black is always just in time. It seems like all this idea was knight h4 and g4 was new because uh, from the games we had here in this database, all the games uh, were played with b takes a6. Maybe we can show this moment. It was the first critical moment of the yeah. game. So if you remember, th this all happened, and then... Uh, yeah, queen d7, a4. And now this move, a4, based on this idea, queen takes b5, a takes b5, and a5. And we were discussing this, but perhaps this can be cleaned to a draw. Like Magnus came six. up with an interesting idea, which is uh, to play g4 and bring the knight around, like this. But it never really got anywhere. Let's see what the... After bishop f4, it does seem to uh, fizzle out very fast. Because instead of rook b3 attacking this pawn, we thought that rook d3 is very exact. And, and it was uh, played. Yes. And after... White gave a check, black went here, white advanced. Black starts pushing his pawn in Grunfeld style, and um, there is just no way forward for white. Yeah, because the pawn is just one square too close for white to mount an attack with the, the second rook. Because black, you're just not in time. Yeah, and we tried to find some ideas here. Also, Magnus spent more than one hour uh, yeah. in that end game, but uh, Magnus invested no. a lot of time here. But uh, in the end, he uh, he didn't even go through the motion of playing d sixty seven because I guess uh, it's just too easy for him. Now I have the view of the playing hall, and uh, all the spectators already left the area. Uh, Soon we will have the press conference where the players will share their thoughts. 
and uh, maybe we'll get more information from there about mm -hmm. the preparation and about how how they spend the rest day uh, and so on so uh, if you have any questions to the players you can actually send them to Fides Twitter the Twitter of uh, World Chess Federation and every day uh, every playing day uh, some of the questions are picked up so maybe your question uh, will actually be asked uh, to the players and uh, I hope uh, I hope th that will happen <laughs> That's right. It's a chance for you to ask a question, so <laughs> why don't you take advantage of that? Richard, do you have any questions to the players? Um, not really. I not think the questions will related. be answered. I understand, but uh, uh, I, I guess both of them enjoyed the football as well, so we already know that. <laughs> and I saw Magnus' photos, but I didn't see Jan's photos. No, I mean watching the ah, Champions watching. League. Yeah, yeah. Ah, okay, I saw that uh, Magnus was actually, actually playing. playing that's, yeah. Yeah. He so does that a lot. That's how he spent his preparation, at least a part of it. And uh, yeah, I I don't know what Jan did. <laughs> yes. Well, you have already told told us a bit uh, what you. Uh, uh, what you actually used to do when you played the World Championship mm -hmm. matches and uh, how you prepared on the rest day. Always the rest day was a chance to break to your rest. routine because you're normally very disciplined, but the night before the rest day, always with this buffer, you have a whole rest day to still get serious and then you cut yourself some slack. I found that very, very useful. I think matches have been much harder without it. Yeah, sure. And how was your rest day yesterday? Okay, after the lecture you gave today. Yes, so I gave a lecture <laughs> and then in the evening I came to see Velamal win the schools championship. Um, I was there for the prize ceremony and then I headed back uh, to the hotel. So, it was a fun day. I wouldn't call it a rest day, but it was a fun day. <laughs> Did you have a chance to walk around and see the pavilions? Yes, I saw a few. I mean, around the Spanish pavilion I got a chance to see something, but... I should, uh, they, well, the expo is huge. I don't think I can cover everything, but uh, definitely take a look around more. Did you enter the Indian one? Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. So it's still on the list. That's right. <laughs> Actually, yesterday I spent many hours here uh, walking around the expo, and it's simply amazing. Uh, if you have a chance uh, and uh, you can come here, I just really take the tickets and and come here because uh what i saw yesterday it was something i uh, didn't see anything of this kind in my life uh it's really the feeling that uh, the whole world is united in one place because um more than uh, 190 uh, nations are represented here and each country is showing, uh, it has its pavilion and uh, it shows like, okay, uh, who we are, why we are here, what is famous in our country. Uh, and it's wonderful. Uh, I mean, all the pavilions, they are uh, designed in such a different way. Every country is represented in its own unique way. Uh, so uh, I really got a lot of emotions yesterday and uh, a lot of nice feelings. I imagine must be an unbelievable number of languages being spoken in the expo grounds. So. Yeah, and also more than 7 million of people already visited uh, uh, this expo, uh, expo in Dubai. So we are expecting maybe, I don't know, 20 million until the end of the exhibition or sure, even quite a while more. left to run, yes. Yeah, so because it's running until March 2022, so uh, yeah, it's huge. A very nice place to be in and also it's uh, great that chess is a part of it and that the World Championship match is held uh, in one of the pavilions. Uh, so, really wonderful atmosphere. I uh, really uh, wish uh, you can come and see it yourself. Oh, here you can see a Twitter of Magnus Carlsen. And uh, yeah, actually you can see a rest day with uh, soccer, basketball, table mm -hmm. tennis, and it was all done. So actually it started with soccer, yeah? Then basketball mm -hmm. and then table tennis. You only see uh, soccer photos. And then people asked him like, oh, what is he going to do tomorrow? If he would play D4, A3, Bond Cloud. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's And funny. somebody is helpfully Translated the bonk cloud into moves. <laughs> I think you never did it, right? 
No. No, you are too serious. <laughs> I'm also too serious for that. <laughs> Uh, but uh, bon well, you can do it in these online things, and it's fine. It's but like I think to actually do it at a board will feels feels wrong somehow. It feels, uh, I don't know. I don't like when this is happening because it's kind of uh, disrespectful towards chess. But though, uh, also white is simply lost for one half move, <laughs> which doesn't help very much. So. <laughs> But Magnus did it for fun in a couple of games, and there were even some games where they repeated the moves like e4, e5, king e2, king e7, king e1, king e8. <laughs> ah, three three time Bonkla repetition. Yeah, three time Bonkla repetition. <laughs> there are even still some people in the pavilion, maybe they are just uh, preparing for tomorrow's game. Tomorrow, Magnus will play with black pieces, and the Jan will play with white pieces. Uh, what are your expectations? No e4? On the other hand, my, uh, Jan could continue for a while longer with e4. Um, it simply depends if they have found some interesting idea in the martial complexes. Also, it must be pointed out that by avoiding the martial, they never find out whether he is actually going to play the martial. <laughs> so they can, Magnus can easily uh, switch back to a normal Royal Lopez if White plays c3. Not against a4, not against uh, h3, yes, he could play d6 and transpose back. So maybe that is a sign that, uh, in fact, he might uh, be sticking to the marshal after all. But we don't know. Uh, but do you think it's reasonable like, to prepare so many anti-marshal lines and then after c3 not to go into marshal? Yeah, why not? You prepare you the anti-marshal. Yes, but you don't have to memorize the marshal at all. You're bluffing. So, you, yeah, if but you if separate you just the play two, d6, you don't have to memorize many of the anti martial lines, which are actually quite critical. That is true, but on the other hand, after h3, uh, knight a5, he might have been an idea he wanted to try anyway. So, he can still switch back to h3, d6 if he wants. Mm -hmm. Ah, maybe you can actually show it on the board because now we have uh, this view where we can do it. So, yeah. what we are talking about is that. Uh, after bishop b5, a6, bishop a4, knight f6, castle bishop e7, rook e1, b5, bishop b3. And now we she uh, said that maybe castles, it's not uh, uh, with the idea to play marshal, uh, what is, uh, which is so arising after c3, c3, d5. Then this is the marshal gambit, d5. But we don't actually know that this is what Carlsen intended. Admittedly, after h3, he could have switched back with d6, thereby... Um, After asking C3 Jan to, to, play C3. to play C3 and go for this. But uh, it's not impossible that after H3, Magnus wanted to have a little fun with this line because he was happy. Uh, so we're not 100% sure. I agree it's a complicated train of thought. But on the other hand, he is permitting this move. So that's a lot of extra work in these sidelines if you were planning to if you were planning to play the Rai Lopez anyway. Actually, it's like with uh, one direction you're avoiding uh, some lines, but with the other ones, uh, yes. yeah, it's like you're avoiding something, but you're allowing something, and with the other with the other lines, it's the same. You're avoiding something and you're allowing something. So it's the question: uh, what you want to play and uh, what you actually want to avoid. But after bishop b3, castle, so uh, in the first game, Jan tried h3 and it was knight a5. In the second game, he tried uh, a4. a4. These are moves 2 and 3 in this position <laughs> in terms of uh, popularity. So you see that c3, allowing the martial gambit, is the number the one line. But uh, the h3 and a4 are the next two. And, and also uh, d3 is here. Well, d4 yeah. uh, also has a big... Uh, Number of games, but uh, d4 is not that popular. But these popular. are the top three moves by, by far. Yeah, though Aronian won some game after d4, knight d4, bishop f7, yeah, in that line. Yes. Like some years ago. I don't remember d4 played on the top level in the last years. Do you? A couple of times. But, of course, they tried to do it with a4, b4, d4, oh, but then, but then it's a different line. That Black has to go with d6. Here, after uh, 
d4, black usually takes with the knight. Now white has two possibilities. One is to go like, push the knight back and then sacrifice a pawn like this. But um, I think the verdict is, if black knows what he's doing, then yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's equal. Square. Yeah. And the other one would be to take here, which is surprising. You do this. Knight takes e5. I wonder how many people have done the bon Cloud version of this. Uh, let's say king <laughs> f7, knight e5, king g8, and then transpose back. That's also possible. No harm done. But uh, knight e5, you go back, queen d4, and then c5 and bishop b7 is typically what they do. So. And it's considered that black has enough compensation. Uh, the compensation goes to the bishop pair and also better development, so after c5. Bishop b7, black is attacking the pawn on e4, uh, then sometimes d6, sometimes d5, it depends on what white does. Uh, yeah, so like d3 is, uh, is the only main option which can be tried because I don't believe so much in d4. Yeah. Or maybe six move d3, the line which Jan played in the candidates and which, which he did quite successfully instead of rook e1. Yes. So d3? d3 is possible. No, there are of course many possibilities. But he's had two chances to play it already, so um, perhaps he just has multiple lines prepared because this is an important part of Magnus's repertoire and so why um, uh, let him get away with only one try? Trump. Uh, we got an update that uh, players do quick interviews before going to the press conference. Here we can see uh, Mike Klein uh, taking an interview with uh, Magnus Carlsen. No, it's actually Tanya Sajdev doing mm -hmm. an interview with uh, uh, Magnus Carlsen. And Mike Klein is, is having an interview with uh, Yanni Ponashe for chess.com. So they have additional obligations. And a uh, tweet from chess24.com, Magnus Carlsen, this whole plan is pretty dangerous for him. Practical, it's not so easy. I thought what he went for looked a bit dangerous, but I couldn't see it. So I assume it was just a draw. It's like a, a short summer of today's game. More or less our conclusion as well. It was a decent try, but uh, Black wasn't in any real danger there. So it seems like we still have a few more minutes for the press conference to begin. Uh, but it will start rather soon. Very nice play in Hoyle. I really like it. And yeah. I also like the cup they have for the winner. Maybe uh, we can have a photo of it. It's um, very beautiful. <laughs> It's a pity there is no smaller cup for like uh, the runner-up. So <laughs> if they could do something similar, it could be really nice. <laughs> they say, no, you lose the match and you're like, oh no, I lost the match and I don't get even the cup. <laughs> yeah, okay. Oh, okay. The press conference is about to start. So you can see Morris Ashley and uh, the players there. Also a lot of photographers and journalists. And uh, yeah, let's wait. It's about to start. I think now there are just some general announcements how, about the procedure and uh, how, is it, uh, how it is going to happen. So just a few technical things to do and the press conference is starting. I think it was already the first question to Magnus, but we couldn't hear it. Magnus was quite unhappy while playing the game. Well, he looked, uh, he was not really very satisfied, but uh, the press conference, he looks okay. Well, it's uh, normal, he's uh, come to terms with what happened, but he, he seems to suggest that his preparation, they thought, it's dangerous, I should have something, but when he actually tried to make something out of it, he realized 
that uh, he doesn't have anything. And, and maybe Jan's body language, the fact that he played everything very quickly, also uh, discouraged Magnus because he realized that he's playing someone who's quite happy to enter this. So. True. And uh, Jan, he's, I think it was a good day for him, not yes. a long one, and uh, basically no real problems for him mm -hmm. in, this, in this game. So maybe we are just waiting that uh, the sound will be transmitted from here to, to that studio. Because the, the press conference is already in progress. I wonder what the, uh, what um, Magnus's response to whether he expected the uh, Petrov was it one of his uh, one of the moves he expected the most or not? The day because we we talk about your expectation about the uh, Petrov and all the stuff they play, but uh, in a match it seems Jan that plays, people finally decide that oh, this is the best move. Uh, uh, no, it was one of the main openings that I have expected seeing that okay, he played it in the, in, the, in the candidates and also the press conference. Um, in the first black game he um, went for uh, for a more classical classical approach rather than than a sharp one. So it was uh, very much uh, much expected. Um, couldn't know obviously which exact Petrov line he was gonna he was gonna go for, but um, Petrov in itself was very much expected. And your feeling about the opening you got? I'm. What can I say? I tried something concrete uh, and um, it didn't work. Uh, but that's I think um, a normal norm, normal result. Um, I didn't expect him obviously to have. To have missed the line that I, I played um, uh, completely, but yeah, in some other iterations, there can be a lot of um, difficult decisions to, to make for for, for Black. Uh, but I think, yeah, the way that he he played, um, there was just th there are some different tries, but there's just nothing and state of state of modern chess. Not much else to say. You did though at the end look like you were working. Overtime, sweating <laughs> to try to get something at the end. You looked like you were really trying very hard before you finally stopped. Uh, why was that? Um, I, I think um, it sometimes happens uh, at World Championships that you work, you work a lot uh, before the before the match, and you work a lot during the match and openings and such, um, and somehow. This makes you work less over the board. My approach was very clear there that I didn't think particularly that I ha had anything, but uh, I have two hours for the game, so I should spend them all uh, looking for whatever chances can can be found. Jan, did you feel like you were in any difficulty at any point during this game? Uh, well, the, actually, the line which happened is... I guess uh, should be known by many who who play Petrov. Yeah, so it's one of the lines which are quite principal. Uh, despite this, I believe knight h4 is a very interesting try. But uh, perhaps I even wanted to play this as white one day. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, uh, but uh, in general, yeah, the task was more or less about not to mix up things here yeah, and not to I don't know, uh, not to do something stupid because uh, as far as I know, this line is more or less to say so safe for black so uh, of course I was checking twice everything and also calculating a lot uh, but uh, in general yeah I think this is quite safe draw for this game satisfying result well since I played Petrov uh, <laughs> indeed and for you Magnus uh, second white tech took a shot but again a draw is this at all frustrating or still early in the match no, it's okay. Um, I've started with a lot more draws than this earlier, um, and um, when you play when you play a forest line as as today, um, you, um, you you don't expect to uh, to hit very very often. But the idea is to um, to hit once in a while, take your opponent by surprise, and the other times you're you're usually going to be very safe. Um, so, um, 
yeah, uh, I, I obviously I would have would have loved to to win. I uh, would have loved to find more chances than I, I did, but I think overall, yeah, it's uh, it's a normal result against the well pre prepared opponents. We'll take our first question from reporters in the room, please. Well, I'm Rune from the Chess Twenty Four Global podcast. And of course, the entire Chess24 team wishes you a happy birthday. Uh, Magnus, my question is for you. Uh, I'm sure that chess fans all over the world hopes for you, uh, that you can go out and celebrate and have a very nice birthday. Will this be possible for you, or do you have to just work, work, work in order to prepare for tomorrow? Um, yeah, I'm playing playing tomorrow. Um, I feel like general idea of World Championship match is that you celebrate after you've uh, hopefully won. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Yeah, my uh, Sagar Shah from Chesswiz, India. My question is to Magnus. Uh, first of all, happy birthday. Uh, you played the move knight h4, which was a first new move. Uh, there were games until a5. And then uh, Nepo's moves were pretty sim like straightforward, g6 and so on. So what were you hoping for? With uh, like, it, In which situation would you have? Uh, um... <laughs> <laughs> there, are, there are insanely complicated lines. If I mean the the the, the approach that he chose is not the only one uh, that black can black can choose. And in other um, in other variations, it's insanely complicated and um, really really risky for um, for for black. Uh, and to be honest, the one he chooses, um, it looks really really risky to leave the knight on f8 and bank everything on on the a pawn if you've miscalculated something you just lose without without any ch without any chances um but it's a lot easier of course when you've studied it and you know that it's a draw and you can kind of work it out from from there but um believe me there are many many other other options um for for black that lead to uh, that lead to much more complications than than what happened in in, in the game. Um, so uh, I I think what what he did was just very very sensible, um, uh, an approach that looks um, a bit dubious at first since your your knight's going to be be locked in, but with um, you know with concrete calculation you can you you can make it work, and um, that's. Uh, that's how you usually solve solve your your opening problems. You try to uh, to avoid the lines where you have to remember everything and try to choose something that you can you can sort of remember the uh, the main points from. Thank you. Mike Klein with Chess.com. My question is for Grandmaster Magnus Carlson. Um, as the journalist core continues to speculate about who your seconds are, and I'm sure you're too cagey to reveal. You've done this so many times before. Can you reveal what's the tenor in your camp? Is it pretty normal from the first four uh, world championships to this one? Or do you notice your team uh, perhaps with different uh, emotions about your openings and how, what kind of positions you've been getting? Um, yeah, so I, I don't really understand the, the gist of your, your, of your question. Uh, I, I think uh, people have... Uh, People have emotions of their own. Uh, those those who work with me for me, um, but um, I'm the one who has to play uh, after all. So their emotions are, um, if not uh, unimportant, they're not really a relevant factor um, to me. Uh, I would say, so far, um, there's very very little to to report. In any case. Hello, Rakesh from Chess.com. Magnus, firstly, a very happy birthday. You've seen four draws, but how did it go on the rest day in the soccer or basketball? Um, yeah, so I um, I was on the winning team the whole time in, in football. Um, don't know if they, they threw intentionally. Uh, if they did, <laughs> I don't really care. Um, but... Um, uh, it definitely, it definitely raised my spirit, so, so, so that's good. Uh, Ole Kristensen from Norway. 
happy birthday to Magnus. Um, a question for both. Um, is this the best way of deciding a world champion or could it be other ways of doing it? Like, for example, the FIFA World Cup way or as an ordinary uh, chess tournament or whatever? Yeah. Well, it's hard to say because uh, I believe uh, their importance of traditions in chess is um, really big. And uh, I guess uh, whatever works, you shouldn't like try to, to make it work better. Yeah, I mean, not, in order not to break it. So I believe this system with them matches is more or less fair. Uh, but, uh, I mean, of course, it has some of these drawbacks because it's like not being played yearly and uh, and so on yeah but i mean uh well it's you know we can discuss it like uh, uh, the whole night magnus um <laughs> uh, there's uh there's a saying that if you don't have anything nice to say you shouldn't say anything at all <laughs> uh so i'm gonna invoke that uh, particular saying right here hi uh Saraunan from chess base my question to Ian. When you played A5 and uh, Magnus played Knight H4 pretty fast, you showed a look of surprise on the board. Um, were you not really expecting this? Was it part of your preparation? Well, uh, only thing I knew that this is, uh, I mean, even without, let's say, Analyzing his position, it's obvious, yeah, that playing knight h4 and letting the pawn leave on e5, yeah, uh, as, as a passive pawn which is protected well by pawn on b6 is quite risky, so mm, uh, that's what you can uh, figure out without preparation. Uh, but uh, yeah, fortunately, I, you know, knew the idea and more or less, you know, more or less uh, I could remember what to do. So, I mean, of course, I was kind of surprised, but because, I mean, this is one of the, to say so, sidelines, but it's, yeah, it's very principal at, at the same time. Yeah, and it's it's better to, uh, it's of course better to remember your moves instead of finding them all, you know, out of the board. Uh, if I can follow that up, uh, you played Rook of C8 after mm -hmm. a minute thought or so. Mm -hmm. Till that point also, did you go by your memory or did you come up with on the board? Uh, well, uh, I guess, uh, I wasn't quite sure what was the correct move after knight eight check immediately king h eight king h six or king g eight, but I remember that king g eight is also just fine. And then okay, uh, I believe more or less until the last move. It's uh, I'm not quite sure, but I think uh, I have seen something like this. Thank you, uh, Alexander Stigniev, TV channel Russia One. My question is for Jan. Ну по традиции можно по русски, если Uh, удобно. Uh, традиционный, опять же, вопрос четвертая ничья. Как оцениваете и uh, складывается, может сложиться впечатление, что поскольку цена ошибки настолько высока, что вы немножко оба, довольно активно играя, немножко искусственно сдерживаете себя и осторожничаете. Вот что по этому поводу можете сказать, Ян? Ну, как четвертая ничья, но сегодня фактически ничья получилась сразу же из дебюта, да, то есть э, тут такая линия, что, в общем, белые спрашивают... Если черные все помнят, то получается ничья. Это довольно частая история вот в современных шахматах, на самом деле, такая так называемая проверка. Вот. Ну и в целом, мне кажется, каждый играет вот настолько, насколько позволяет соперник. То есть, ну, очень сложно в дебюте завязать борьбу. То есть, да, ну, вот сегодняшняя партия, например, ну, может быть, не самая яркая, но все же тому подтверждение, да, что, в принципе, там новая интересная идея за белых, но, в общем, она уже тоже как бы оказалась новой, ну, не для всех. Спасибо. Grand Master Zeman with Chessable. Um, my question to Jan is: Over the past sort of few years, you know, we've seen you make big strides and big improvements, and I've noticed sort of a change in your opening style. And I think you've been known to be sort of like a very sharp player, maybe utilizing some less classical opening choices. But recently, with the Petrov and other choices, I'm trying to understand: Is this change in opening style do you think this has been critical to your recent success well uh, basically it doesn't matter what do you play if you if you know what you're doing yes yeah, so well in that case uh, I mean 
you could name basically one of like three or four very solid openings with black and uh, if you let's say study them by heart uh, you can uh, be uh, I, get, I believe more or less successful but uh, I mean speaking about my uh, more or less uh, recent results it's more about the general approach uh, other like picking some particular openings yeah. and if I may continue what Magnus said about the football he played yesterday you know as, as uh, one of your opponents do you think that anyone was afraid to go too hard on you uh, if they were to injure you because I certainly did not want to be the guy who injured you uh, before the the next day yeah it's it's an interesting uh, it's an interesting question um, I think a lot of people would indeed have um, have that mentality that they would not want to to injure um, you know somebody um, uh, like important to, to a lot of a lot of people uh, I've played with some uh, professional footballers in my life uh, and my approach then was very different like I, I always felt it would be a fun story if I <laughs> injured them if when they played on uh, on their on their spare time um, and um, um, yeah, that's so. I always went like extra hard uh, against uh, against them, um, and um, it gave me uh, gave me an edge because it forced them to to shy away instead. So a little tip there. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to give you more of a challenge next time. But uh, thank you. Thank you. Anastasia Karlovich is based. Hello, everyone. Um, Magnus, happy birthday! And my question is actually about your birthday because you, I don't know if you know that Winston Churchill was born the same day as you. And uh, do you think you have something in common with a former prime minister of Great Britain? The first question, or maybe you remember some of his quotes or expressions. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, I mean, there was this quote from Churchill and one of his opponents, I think, that he was a very modest man and he had, he had great reasons to be modest. Uh, so I would say for my opponent that he's not a mo modest man and with good reason. Okay, thank you. And uh, one more question also for Jan. Uh, which wishes would you like to give to Magnus today on his birthday? I mean, just uh, enjoy what he's doing and like be healthy, happy, lucky, and you know, all the best. Thank you. <laughs> uh, a question for Jan. Uh, how is this championship match going uh, according to what you planned? Are you playing better, worse, or according to plan? Uh, I might probably tell this uh, when the match will be over. <laughs> well, we have two more questions, please. Mike Clinic at chess.com. Question again for Magnus. Um, this may sound like a silly question, but it's actually quite serious. A lot of athletes, when they get into their 30s, the recovery time is lessened. And I've seen you play sports during World Championships for three or four hours at a time. So does your body feel any different after these rest days when you do a lot of sports? Yeah, it's, it's, really, uh, it's a really good question. Um, there were... Um, well, there was one person in my team yesterday who had one task and one task only, uh, which was to pull me away uh, after uh, um, you know set number of, of matches so that I would not um, not be be too tired. So uh, that's certainly something that I'm I'm conscious of. Any more questions? Uh, Magnus, in the end, you were thinking for 22 minutes for Knight F6, also 34 minutes. Could you share some of the lines that you were looking at? Like, were there some opportunities? Yeah, I was um, was considering a lot of things um, like D6, um, King G2, followed by by Rook Rook E8, uh, also Rook A2, followed by Rook E3 after Rook B3. Um, but um, yeah, black just seemed to to hold uh, hold uh, everywhere. I guess d6 was um, kind of the um, the most obvious way to uh, to try and, and find something. But I I didn't think it was close. We just have one more question from Fide Chess Twitter page. Uh, you can send your questions in, and you may uh, get hear them here on the air. Magnus, to you, do you plan on sharing any of your birthday cake with Team Nepo? <laughs> uh, 
Uh, yeah, that's uh, that's a weird question. Um, first of all, I don't know if I'll have any. Uh, maybe a little bit tomorrow, um, but um, I, I I think with the history of World Championship matches, I don't think you would uh, accept any piece of food from the opposing <laughs> team ever. <laughs> With that, we conclude the press conference. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Tomorrow's game will be at 16.30. It will be game five. Thank you, and have a good night. Today, more than ever, when the world comes together to create a better tomorrow. It's going to be magic. Oh. Magic. Magic with music. With architecture. With colors. Magic with celebration. With your safety. From here. There. And everywhere. For six whole months. Day and night. Join the making of a new world starting October 1st.